All right. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. I'm Daniel Larson. I'm running for U.S. Senate in the state of Montana. Um, originally, this was supposed to be on uh, Andrew Davis's channel, but uh, he is um, at work. But uh, thank you for joining this forum. Uh, you know, candidates, if you're going to want to be if you're going to want different candidates uh, in the future, I think it's important for us to develop vehicles where we have robust discussions about the the issues that we're all facing. Uh, we need uh, need an infrastructure to support us uh, going forward. Um, so thank you for joining this. Uh, this is the, the idea is that we get more voters paying attention to some of these candidates that that aren't really getting the attention. We're challenging some pretty important incumbents. So if you want a democracy that looks different in the future, I think it's important to uh, pay attention to content like this. Um, so anyway, without further ado, uh, first guest here is uh, Russ. Russ, <laughs> how's it going, Russ? Hey, uh, hi, Dan. I'm doing great. How are you? <laughs> Good. So it's my first time hosting, um, but uh, just go ahead and give everybody if they didn't pay attention last week, a, a little rundown about yourself, and then we can discuss a few issues. Oh yeah, so um, so you're in Montana, I'm in New Jersey, uh, the sixth district, and uh, it's Middlesex, Monmouth counties. We're 37 miles of coastline, and we have some pretty big urban areas and suburban areas. Where our district is um, one of the uh, top 10 most unequal district in terms of income inequality. We have some very working class, uh, low income areas and mega mansions in the other half of the district. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a government attorney. I've drafted laws. I've been in courtrooms standing up to big money. And what we need right now are more, uh, more attorneys, more, more people, more working people uh, standing up and running for office because we deserve a Congress, both the House and the Senate, uh, filled with people who have real world experience um, and, you know, have struggled, you know, have have lived the struggle of being an everyday American. And, um, you know, you're you're running the Republican primary, right? I'm running I'm, I'm running the Democratic primary. I'm a New Deal Democrat. I really want to take uh, our party back to where it was during uh, the time when we represented workers, represented unions, fought for all the you know, for, for long weekends and, and better wages. And, uh, but, you know, even though we're different, like different parties, you have an R next to your name and I have a D next to mine. Uh, I, there's a lot of stuff that there's a lot of issues that we agree on. And we've spoken in the past and, you know, I, I find we agree on the big, the big stuff. So uh, yeah. I'm, I'm thankful for you stepping up and hosting and uh, let's make it uh, a good show. <laughs> yeah, so I think that originally when I was uh, reaching out to you, I, I was thinking it was very valuable for for voters to see the types of discussions that you and I uh, or or other potential federal legislators would have if we were just independent voices that were actually, you know, root cause troubleshooting some of these larger issues. So we don't have to agree on 100 percent of things. And, and I think that, you know, our democracy would be uh, better served if if we got um, you know people like yourself um, instead of incumbents in there because uh, the politics and and you had mentioned it a little bit but corporate politics is um, you know the term I think currently is is a partisan death spiral so is it, it, what are your thoughts on that partisan death spiral yeah well you know we have. Um, parties that refuse to work together we have um we have incumbents that are very jaded by the system where uh, where they wind up working on things that benefit the same donors that they have the same big donors that they have right so we've seen massive wall street bailouts uh, massive uh, insurance company bailouts uh, cruise line bailouts we've seen them agree on issues like endless war and uh, an over bloated military budget. Uh, these are the things that, uh, you know, working class candidates would, would probably not agree on. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I wouldn't vote for um, expanding the military budget. I'd try to pull in our endless occupations across the, across the globe. But I think uh, people who are not politicians for their entire lives, right, 
would go into Congress and uh, and get to and get to work for the people, you know. Yeah, I've, and I think that's what your campaign represents as, as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that there's a couple of things that are are propped up. I'm seeing it in races where, uh, like, the Republican talking points right now are just this anti-socialism thing. They've decided to label everything as socialism, and they know that voters aren't really able to dis- discern what what the true you know what that means so it's just an emotional rhetoric that are getting people into office um what what are you seeing within the establishment talking points on the democratic side well it's all about things like access to health care which access doesn't mean a, a thing you know i when i used to work in, when i used to work in midtown manhattan i walked past a ferrari dealership and as I'm walking through, looking looking in the window, yeah, I guess I have access to a Ferrari, but I'll never afford one of those things. Um, so we need to guarantee health care coverage as a right in this country with Medicare for all, guaranteeing uh, Americans health and peace of mind during times like coronavirus and pandemics. We're really seeing, um, We, I mean, we see a lot on the Democratic side, a lot of identity politics, mm-hmm. which I, I think is probably almost as bad as just like, you know, lab- labeling things as socialism, right? Republicans calling everything socialism. They call, they call Obamacare socialism when we really know it's a massive uh, health insurance industry handout. It grants yeah. the insurance companies a monopoly. So we're seeing, uh, you know, the, the rhetoric and the, um, and the talking points that just don't really mean anything of substance. That's what I think we're both opposed to, right? Right, right. So the the talking points that don't mean anything of substance that just get people to vote based off of an ideology without any um, looking at, uh, you know, a candidate at a really deep level. Uh, one thing that I get is, um, so I'm facing a pretty strong incumbent and a lot of Republicans are saying, you know, why would we vote for you? Um, we want the power in Washington. So what do you think that the power in Washington really, what do you think that these incumbents uh, can offer that we can't? Uh, it's on, It's honestly the, probably the money. I don't know. Do you take corporate PAC money or lobbyist money? <laughs> I've taken about, uh, you know, $1,000, something like that. So, and it's all from the people. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty happy about that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, no, so no corporate PAC money, no lobbyist money. That's no. I don't <laughs> understand how you could have an honest voice in the conversation if you were taking the type of money. I think that uh, these candidates are taking. You're you're absolutely right. Like you, representatives who take that big money represent the big money interests. That's it. And when when the establishment sh- machine says things like, "Oh yeah, we have so much power in Congress," what they really mean is the person that's in charge has the corporate money, the the lobbyist money flowing all the way down the stream of local politics too. And we see that throughout the entire country. Uh, we see the big money gets its way into every single election. And, you know, I remember one thing that we definitely agreed on is ending the corruption in politics, right? Right. Like right. Getting that big money out. Yeah. And, and I think that what I'd like to do is paint a picture for future voters, because I think that there's a generation that is held on to, you know, it's like a political elite class and that uh, the voters coming up need to assess candidates differently than we have in the past so that we could really build this. You know, if people have to realize that there's 535 members of the congressional delegation. And if you really want things to change, we have an opportunity every two years. And so if you're looking at a candidate and their their uh, their voice is being um, distorted by corporations and PACs, then you're going to get some of the things that that we're seeing. So one of the things that I would like to call out is like we have like real injustice. So we have injustice in our food system our criminal justice system, um, just the, the chemical companies on their own, our pursuit of energy policy that's destroying the planet. Mm. Um, some of the things I, I think one of the topics that we were, um, you know, wanted to speak to today was just injustice overall. Um, it, it, how do you feel about that issue or the larger issue? There's so, there's so many different, um, cat, there's so many ca- different categories of injustice that really the American people have grown to, um, you know, 
really get complacent with. And I think an injustice to anyone anywhere is an injustice to everyone, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we just saw uh, this week with, uh, with Mr. Arbery in Georgia uh, how it took over two months for uh, his murder, the people who murdered him, yeah. to, be, to be arrested. And now we have to wait even more for longer for justice. It's, uh, you know, that that just goes to show that um, the once once people heard saw the video and we be, we became activated and thousands of people called into this Georgia prosecutor's office uh, that the public pressure finally brought them to arrest two murderers who murdered some, who, who murdered a black man in cold blood on the street and. Um, we, we need racial justice in this country. We, we, we need justice for, uh, for everyone here. We need economic justice. We need environmental justice. Like these issues are, do have not gone away because of coronavirus. And, you know, I think a, a really working class Congress would address these things. We need, we need the DOJ to have independent oversight, like, uh, of, of all, of, of really all ra racially motivated crimes and things like that. Um, there's so much we have to do in this country. Yeah, so I think the DOJ oversight is at a bare minimum. The thing, yeah. the thing that I keep, you know, um, that I have a hard time with is, is if there wasn't a video on this one, you know, and there's a lot of injustice that, that doesn't have a video on it. And I think that one of the things that I think is systemic is this hyper criminalization of different, uh, you know, in this case, I think it's the black community, but, you know, black and brown communities uh, suffer from this, you know, hyper criminalization and it influences the school system, the justice system, um, all of these things, but it really starts within our, our public dialogue. And that's why I joined the, the uh, Republican side of the aisle is I think that the the messages that are coming out are actually destructive. They're leading to this um, accommodation of like the furthering of this this uh, social state that that builds this injustice in into the process. So, yeah, right. Um, you, you're you're right. I mean, it comes from the, from the president, right? Right. Uh, and it, it's it's unacceptable in today's society. Yeah, and it's it's um, one of those things that I mean I think we're similar ages, but uh, it's one of those things that I remember like in school. I, I thought it was getting better, um, you know, and I thought by the time we got to you know the, you know our mid forties and fifties that that things would be things would be moving in the right direction, and I, and I'm sad that 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 we're going back you know 25, 30 years, and there's rhetoric yeah. that 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 goes out there, you know, false numbers. Um, you know, mm -hmm. people, people being, you know, told to go back to where they came from and like those things just shouldn't be acceptable at all right. anymore. And we need a lot more people to call it out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, within the, the, uh, New Jersey, you have a lot of peaker plants, right? Um, within the energy grid. Uh, we have, so we have uh, a lot of super fun sites, which is, you know, the, the sites where there's tons of pollution that still haven't been cleaned up. We have the, the most actually in the nation, I think, with besides maybe California. And um, so the, the peaker sites, what, what do you mean? The pumping stations or? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, it just with the, these are the auxiliary power units that come on mm -hmm. and they're, they usually have a really high environmental load and they, they affect like respiratory conditions you know, in communities that, that live around them, but usually they're located exactly in the communities uh, of color or the low income communities. So there's this, this environmental injustice that I, I was uh, just wondering if, if that was an issue in New Jersey, but it's certainly if you have this super high number of, of uh, super fun sites. Uh, yeah, no, it's, def it's definitely an issue uh, in, in Newark, there uh, so there is actually a, a chemical plant that uh, now Trump has reduced the, the EPA regulations so so far that this co this chemical company can now continue um, restart a polluting process where the fumes are actually pink, and the fumes are released into the sky and it makes it look like the sun setting, 
when they're releasing this toxic chemical that creates brain damage. And it's in, it's in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, Newark, New Jersey also has a water crisis similar to Flint. We're mm-hmm. seeing we're seeing a pollution, uh, you know, really affect our communities everywhere. And I, I just don't see. I don't see either party really preventing it, but um, we have to clean up our world. Yeah, I could definitely see um, just looking through the SEC filings, just uh, where energy is playing a hand in these uh, races that uh, we can't get to a responsible energy solution unless uh, people that are uh, that are um, representing the will of the people versus the will of the corporations actually get a voice at the table. Mm -hmm. Um, it's happening everywhere. You were talking about New Jersey, but you know, my, my elementary school was, um, a block away from the Superfund flood site itself. And there's a lot of, a lot of that legacy, um, economic growth uh, at all costs, even if it's an environmental cost that that we get into trouble. Yeah. Right. uh, yeah, sorry. I took up a lot of the time that, that we were supposed to discuss. So uh, no, it's good. Yeah. How, do, how do people get a hold of you? How, how do they support what you're doing there, Russ? Uh, just check out the website, russforus2020.com. Uh, we definitely need volunteers to phone bank. Tomorrow we're phone banking all day, pretty much. And every Saturday, Sunday, pretty uh, pretty much all day. Uh, maybe not, uh, probably not this Sunday because it's Mother's Day. But um, yeah. I really like uh, to get get to meet people and our volunteer staff here has been amazing so far. So, but thanks for being involved and, and I appreciate it. Yeah. So uh, hopefully if you're out there listening, uh, volunteer for Russ, the, you've already got phone bank set up, you know, just a few hours could change things in, in, in your direction, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. All right. Thanks Russ. All right, Dan. Thanks a lot. All right. So next up, I have uh, Jason Sigmund. Uh, Jason, let's see. Jason is a software developer from Dallas, Texas. He is running as an independent for the U.S. House of Representatives in Texas, uh, District 32, uh, versus Democratic incumbent Colin Allred and GOP challenger uh, Geneva Collins. All right, so let's meet Jason. Hey, Jason, how are you? Good. How about yourself? How's it going? Good, good. We haven't met before. I'm Daniel Larson. I'm running for U.S. Senate as a Republican in in the state of Montana. So thank you for doing this. Absolutely. Um, thank you for having me. And, you know, thank you to Joshua. I'm sure he's on, you know, for doing the back end grunt work, labor of love. You know, <laughs> we, we sometimes, I'm sure, you know, can be the, the front facing side, but it's really the people behind the scenes that, you know, make the magic happen. So, you know. Whether that's you or you volunteer on the campaign, uh, you know, just shout out to all y'all as well, because really that's yeah. that's why we're here. Yeah. Volunteers are uh, invaluable. So I think 10 volunteers are worth about a million dollars if, if you get people that are really. Convinced. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, so, Jason, just go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit to the audience. Uh, sure. So, as I said, uh, my name is Jason Sigmund. I'm originally from North Carolina, but I've uh, been in Dallas for about four years. Uh, Like many of you, I think over the last five, 10 years, I've really just watched our politics take a nosedive off of the cliff. Uh, We went from a country of ideas, a country of innovation, to a country that really wants to be the global police force, really doesn't want to solve any problems, just wants to say, sure, I got elected. I'll take my six-figure paycheck. I'll do what my donor says, wham, bam, thank you, goodbye. And, you know, here we here in Dallas, we had a probably I would say 10, 10 year incumbent, really someone who didn't even live in the district half the time. You saw that that wave um, kind of build up against Donald Trump, elected Colin Allrod. And, you know, to be honest, I didn't really think that in 2020 I would be running. I, you know, I went to his first town hall, optimistic, say, OK, great, you know, maybe have some change. Um, his background is he was um, NFL player, but also voting rights attorney. You know, great things that I'm certainly a big fan of. But I think I left the event thinking, wow, is this is this really it? Is this the best that we can do? I mean, it has a really great, interesting story. It really just felt like, OK, so you're going to play the safe route. And so kind of started the wheels turning and and really just kind of started talking to people, as I think, you know, many people that get into office do and say, does this make sense? Like, do you agree with me? Do you, you know, do you not? And we we'll just take the, the pulse on what people are, are both concerned about and where they see the opportunities. And. Obviously, you know, you, particularly now, the number one is certainly healthcare, And I think that was really the, the number one thing that really drove me into this race more than 
probably anything else because ultimately, you know, if you're not healthy, you're, you're just not here. I mean, whether it's you're sick or unfortunately you're passing away for whatever reason, you know, we have politicians now that are saying there's things more important than living. I, I personally love to know what those things are because if you're not alive, I don't really know how you do anything else, but you know, maybe some people have, have found a way beyond that, but you know, not going down that rabbit hole. I think it's just to say our health is important. And for many people, I think it's ridiculous that your health care isn't tied to you having a job that, you know, that means you can't take time to spend with your kids or take care of a relative or, you know, really go out and be an entrepreneur in the country that supposedly is built upon people becoming entrepreneurs. We've said, you know, your role is just to be a, a wheel turner, cog in the wheel, whatever. Just do your part. Take your 40 hours a week. Wham, bam, done. Goodbye. And I think it's like, I think we can do more, you know, having lived overseas in Hong Kong, seeing somewhat of a public private partnership hospital, by no means perfect. I mean, I definitely can give you some stories of, you know, I don't know if that was the best way to do things, but I think from talking to friends there, you know, no one really fears that, oh, if I get sick, then that's the financial ruin. But I hear that all the time from talking to voters is, you know, I'm, I'm one illness away, I'm an, an accident, I'm a layoff away from really being in a lot of trouble. And even if you're not sick, you know, maybe you're reliant on a prescription or a doctor that you need to see to manage some condition that you have. And to put people in such a position where you're always on a knife edge, I mean, I think that translates into so many different areas of your life. And so for me, I think how we start to fix this problem is it starts really with two things. Number one, it starts with community health, because if you can catch diseases early, you can really make a huge difference. We spent so much time in this country waiting until, you know, you have stage four cancer or until you're at the very end of life. And then we want to do these massively expensive interventions that unfortunately are, are largely ineffective at times versus a, hey, can we intervene early? Are we, do we have tools to help you promote a healthy lifestyle? Everything from, you know, getting into barbershops, beauty salons, et cetera, for communities that may not have a doctor they can easily rely on. Instead of having medicine that exists for you to go find, you know, bringing medicine, bringing healthcare to people and trying to find ways to deliver it, you know, most affordably while still maximizing outcomes. And the second is really to break up big pharma and I think large insurance industries as well. I mean, it, the ACA Affordable Care Act was supposed to address a lot of these things, but in my opinion, truly really the American Consolidation Act, because all it really did was make the bigger players bigger. The same thing that happened with Wall Street, and its bailout, the, big, the bigger got bigger and the little got left behind. And I think we haven't really seen healthcare costs go down. And we also, at this point, we don't have any party offering any solution. It's either we're going to make the ACA better. Well, the ACA was never good to start with, or we're going to dismantle the ACA and replace it with something that honestly has only come out as worse. So I don't really understand how, you know, we have so many smart people in this country. The, the two things we can come up is the lesser of two evils. I think that that's ridiculous. And so really what I'm calling for as I talk to people is a, a Kennedy S, let's go to the moon. Let's really reinvent healthcare. And do I think it, it could be expensive? Yeah, sure. I mean, going to the moon by no means was cheap, but I think it's a necessary investment of if you can intervene and keep people healthy, if you can allow them to really develop into the best version of themselves because they're not held back by, you know, do I need to get, worry about getting sick or do I need to worry about, you know, who's going to take care of my kid if something happens to me? I think we can create a lot more exciting opportunities. So that's really the, the first core issue for me. The second is um, criminal justice reform. As, as someone who's been given plenty of, of second chances, who has benefited from mentors and, and people in my life of all different shapes, all different ethnicities, sexual orientations, et cetera, I think it's really unfortunate that it seems that our, our criminal justice system, really justice system overall, looks at what do you look like and who do you know, and then we'll render verdicts accordingly. You know, we have this innocent until proven guilty concept that we've largely thrown out of the window and just say, well, you should plead guilty because we've decided we don't want to fund our public defenders. Mm -hmm. We don't really want to fund and to assume, like, are you actually innocent? We just want to assume, well, a cop assumed that you were in this place or someone said, yeah, that was Larry. He did it. OK, well, Larry, you've been arrested. So we're just going to presume you're actually guilty. Please just take a plea. We don't want to go through this, the, the hassle of actually figuring this out. And then that's what gives rise to these organizations like the Innocent Project that are like, look, this is decades. I mean, whether it's the 80s, 70s, 90s, I mean, even now, I mean, even, you know, with the shootings that we have now with people who you, you throw out certain laws, you thought, oh, this doesn't apply to me. Or why is this person arrested when they clearly didn't do something? Or, you know, now you also have the, the Mike Flynn situation of, you know, some people are for it, some people are not. But regardless of whether you're pro or against the Mike Flynn ruling, what you can't, I think, argue at this point is the Justice Department is largely broken. 
Like it, it doesn't work for what it's supposed to do, which is really to enforce the laws of America and apply them equally and go after the powerful. And it's not just in an individual situation. You've seen this in corporations as well. Since Enron largely was the last kind of big head on the spike, so to speak, of corporations that were brought down by effective prosecution and you know investigative journalism. Since then, you just have these companies that kind of have fraud or not, or you know maybe they get a slap on the wrist or 2008, which I think also too, I would imagine for a lot of people on this call was really a, a big push of what went wrong in this country. You know, no, no one went to jail. The, the closest thing we had was a, a prosecution of a small Asian American kind of community bank that again, why, <laughs> never was the problem at the, at the start, but was an easy target. And I think that justice and really America is, is worse off for that. And so for me, I think it comes back with, you know, how do we change incentives for prosecutors? How do we make it so that you're not really overworked and underpaid? So you're more or less pushed out into going into banking to, you know, subvert the regulations you help write or going into big New York or big DC law because, well, again, you know that inside track and you know how to get your clients out. So you're making 10, 20 times what you would have ever made at the Justice Department. And, you know, how do we just reinvent justice so that people are incentivized to stay in the government to actually protect individuals? And, and maybe it's not, you know, forever, but at least it's less of a revolving war that we have now and people are more motivated and not using it as, okay, I'm just gonna use this to get my big wall position at the end of this. And then the final thing for me is really education. And education really is not just a, I think, K to 12 thing. It's really a whole life how do we better educate Americans overall? So the first of the traditional K to 12 is I think we really need to modernize our curriculum. The, the essentially that we've been on this conveyor belt where five to 10% of people are largely set up to go to college. You know, the vast majority are sent to be, whether they're in a factory, in a field, you know, some clerical work, and you're kind of pushing people through. And then you have 20 to 30% of people where well, you'll do the manual labor or we'll just figure out a job. Well, you know, I think whether it's Andrew Yang or really probably that's probably the, the person who really brought it out but it's just becoming obvious that many of these jobs are not there anymore and so to me i envision the future of america where people's identity and who they are is less defined by where they work you know who they work with and it's more about how are you creating a positive impact in your community i think the the, the first thing that we have or the best thing maybe at right now is ubi do i think that it's a fully fleshed out and perfect concept you know no probably not but i think what we do need is we need more conversations around what does this look like because sure people have heard oh well you know there's some automation of of a cleaning or you know maybe you have someone doing simple tasks um you know replacing calculations that you're now doing on the computer but i think what you're going to see over the next five to ten years is really the what america is built on which is the truck drivers the clerical staff you know, even accountants that you're, I don't want to say you're not going to need fully, but you're going to need a lot less of them. And I just don't think that it's completely realistic that you're going to massively retrain these people, particularly when the closest thing that we've had from a government side is trying to re, uh, retrain coal miners in West Virginia and kind of Appalachia overall. And I think we'll probably all agree that's unfortunately been a failure. And so if we have that as a smaller case study, then I don't see how we're going to magically scale it up and you know train even more people across a much broader geographic area. I think we just really need to reassess and what does it mean to support your family? Like what does it mean to make a contribution beyond clocking in and clocking out? So you know those are my 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 three reasons of getting in. Um, but I really like to talk to people of, of all shapes and forms and really understand like what what are your key issues. I love working with people because. We don't have to agree on everything. We just really have to agree that the problems that we are facing are only going to be solved by us not fighting, but working together. So we'd love to have you come on board. Um, best way to kind of keep in touch is finding me on Twitter, uh, Jason uh, X Sigmund, uh, but also just check out my website and love to chat more. Love to answer any questions that you have. Yeah. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, comments that, that went through the stream. I think it's, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I can do this here, but. There we go. Uh, so, <laughs> so the uh, and so that I mean, you went through a lot of different issues, and there's a, a couple of things that I, I wanted to call out. You mentioned uh, Enron, right? Yep. So we had Enron, Tyson, and then we had the financial crisis, and then now we have the slush fund bailout um, in the system. 
So if we were sitting there as federal legislators, um, what do you think our, our, our actions should be uh, to prevent this? So I think the, the most basic thing is, is and I think it's a, a little bit hard, I'll fully admit, to understand from the outside, but it starts with the SEC. Like to me, I don't think yep. the SEC is doing the job that it's set up to do, which is to create public markets that ensure that people are accurately reporting their financial data and that there's enforcement mechanisms when they don't follow through on that. So again, with there, there's big ideas that I have that require a much bigger rewrite in how we structure America, but there's much simpler ideas to start with, why does this not work? And trying to talk to people from the SEC, you know, also trying to engage academia, also talk to people in the business community because the system is not working. And, you know, people want to say, oh, you know, it all, what goes around comes around, like they'll, they'll be figured out at some point. But unfortunately, that point that we're supposedly figuring out goes along and it keeps going. And at the same time, the government says, oh, this business is struggling. Great. We're going to pump more good money into a bad business. And so we all suffering because we don't flush out the bad. And yeah. so we just have all these organizations that suck up capital that I think create financial malfeasance. And it gets a lot harder as, let's say, a good company to play by the rules when you're like, look, you know, we're just delivering X product, like we just kind of grow on a steady space, or, you know, we're consistently hitting our objective. And then you see, okay, severe corporate malfeasance. Oh, wow, Wall Street loves this. This is what we're being encouraged. And then you have private equity firms and hedge funds that move in and they say, well, you're not, you're not growing quick enough. Or you're not kind of, you know, pushing that envelope enough that we want to see. And so then you just have very short term thinking which is a lot of the, we're going to have excessive share buybacks, we're going to have excessive share dividends, we're not going to raise employee salaries. And then when something goes wrong, you see over the past five, 10 years, record profits, but then at the first sign of trouble, it's, oh, nope, sorry, I need help. When really, if you set up a company in a sustainable way, you should have the ability to survive this first initial hump. Sure, there may be things that you need to cut out, maybe you don't make that new investment, maybe you don't expand to a new country, but it shouldn't be the you know reckoning that I feel like we are seeing with a lot of these companies where it's if I don't get help in, in three months, I'm going to have to declare bankruptcy, which right. isn't as bad of a thing as I think we make it out in this country to be, which is I, generally I, like, I, oh, you're going to go out of business. Everyone's going to laid off. That's not really what federal, particularly for large scale bankruptcy is. However, I also don't think you should be in that stage if you really set up your company to run effectively and you're playing by the rules and you're investing for the future, not just to make your your rich few shareholders happy. and. Yeah. I think, too, we hear so much about markets and it's like, you know, mom and pop investor. Well, mom and pop investor only are something like 10 to 20 percent of the market. Most of it is large scale institutional investors, which, again, benefit from these extreme, in my opinion, ridiculous corporate bailouts at the expense of, you know, the mom and pop who's been saving money or is, you know, looking to start some sort of business. They are the ones who really get shortchanged. As you know, politicians are preaching, oh, look, I'm, I'm concerned about them or oh, I'm going to step in there when, you know, the facts are you're not. I mean, they're not the people writing your checks. And so you say, well, they're not important to me. And I think that that's wrong. Wow. Uh, <laughs> so it, it seems like you're, you've definitely thought a little bit about these issues. One thing that I just wanted to call out since we're, we're both seeing things pretty similarly is uh, – the the corporate influence on policy decisions actually leads to these destructive financial behaviors and in each one of these cycles that you can you can dial it back to a direct uh, policy change that enabled high risk behavior you know so it's it's almost like there is so much political influence that they're actually in they're actually controlling the government to do these things, you know, and right. And and I think too that that's a good point. And it touches on too how do we reduce kind of dark money and clean up our elections. And we've seen experiments, I believe, mostly in Seattle with freedom dividends for their, their city council races or their small races. And they'll they'll be the first to admit that it's not a perfect system yet. And I don't think it's necessarily a perfect system yet. But I think the important thing is it's a starting point. Because what we, what I've heard now is people who get very concerned of, well, I don't want my tax dollars to support my opponent. Well, if your tax dollars are not going to support your opponent, guess where their, ta guess where their campaign contribution comes from? From your corporate people that you criticize day in and day out and say, you know, why does ABC Big Corp get a bailout? So it's either we decide, you know, I don't have to agree with you, but I appreciate you participating in the political process. And as a society and as kind of a community, 
but your life's the least structured in such a way that you get the majority of the funding. Sure, maybe we allow of individual donations that people can give or, you know, small contributions, but these entire like back corporate dark money campaigns where you're just essentially at the beck and call of a lobbyist because you have to spend so much money on TV ads or spend so much money on social media because you have nothing to say beyond what someone tells you. I, you get in the situation where I think why we are struggling so much as a country versus other countries is people we've elected don't know how to leave. They're not elected because they know how to leave. They're elected because they know how to say the right things to people in power and to cash checks and to do it again and again and again. And until yep. we break that cycle, we're going to continue to find that America in times of crisis responds the worst while still pretending that we have everything figured out. And there's plenty of hardworking people who believe in this country. And I think this country really underperforms what it could be. But it's because the people that we have unfortunately been entitled to deal with don't know what they're doing. And I think that that's really whether it's on the call or something, it's we have got to yeah. interfere and break up that system. And it's not necessarily as simple as this Republican Democrat thing, a flip a coin, it'll be different yeah. when my party's in charge because the system is broken and the bill has come due. We have been yeah. found just messed up as a country. And I think it's time to change. And it really starts with people becoming involved in elections, becoming involved in their community. And let's go out and make a difference. All right. Well, uh, thanks, uh, Jason, for coming on. Uh, I Absolutely. hope voters really pay attention to what you're doing <laughs> and, and elect an independent there in, in Texas. Thank uh, you so you much. Wanna, you want to go ahead and let people know how to get a hold of you? And... Yeah, the, the biggest thing is, is just to find me on social media, um, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, Twitter is probably the best. Just search for me, Jason Sigmund. Just add, add an X in between my first and last name. You'll find my Twitter username. You know, feel free to check out my website, jasonsigmund.com. Uh, you can also send me an email, um, jason at jasonsigmund.com. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to really be the most easy to access candidate. I'm, I'm sure at some point that will probably come out and bite me. But in this stage, I think that even if you don't agree with anything that you have said, at least feeling like you have someone who's running for public office who wants to hear from you and wants to hear your ideas. Because again, as I said, we will together create something that's even better than, you know, Dan, you or I can come up with on our own. It's really a community. Yep. We have this phrase, it takes a bill to raise a trial. I think it really takes a country to save a country. So we really just have to come keep putting out new ideas and find something that works better in the current system. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Jason. I, I really hope you win. Uh, hey, <laughs> thank you. You as well. <laughs> It'd be a pleasure to work with you. Thank you. Damn. I'm having technical difficulties here. <laughs> yeah. So uh, next we have Barrington. So Damn. Barrington Martin is a graduate from uh, Georgia State University with a degree in political science. Yes. He is. Uh, you were born in Atlanta, Georgia. Absolutely. Uh, you share it. Share strong desires uh, to see America realize the dreams of our great civil rights leader Martin Luther King, and you're running for U.S. Uh, House of Representatives in Georgia 5th. Yes, sir. First of all, Dan. So thanks, to... thanks, uh, Barrington. Sorry. So, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, no, yeah, go ahead. No, no, first I want to say that it's very good speaking to you. I can. As do. This is past due. We were supposed to have been had a conversation a long time ago, man, but my schedule and my workload has been so hectic with trying to campaign during the coronavirus, you know. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Well, yeah. Uh, you're actually uh, breaking up on my end just a little bit, but uh, I'll just say that it, it's good to uh, meet you in person. You know, we, we have uh, spoke on the phone, but, you know, campaigning and coronavirus and, and trying to win a congressional seat Absolutely. is a is a busy task. And so Absolutely. Um, hello, Josh. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? All right, right. Yeah, no, you're fine. You're coming through clearly. I think, I don't know if I'm lagging or I don't know if you hear me in real time. Okay. Okay. All right.
You everything is everything okay? Dan, we can hear very Okay. I can see I can see Joshua's um statement. I just want to make sure um, Okay, so I'm I'm yeah. yeah, that's fine. Um so if everybody can hear you fine, um just just go for it, talk about your race, talk about the issues that you're seeing. Um and we'll uh we'll catch up when you're when you're there. Okay, okay. Um good evening guys. Well, um I'm in Atlanta. First of all, excuse my attire because normally I would dress up, but um I'm just gonna pretend like this is a 2020 um fireside chat, but you're not with FDR, but it's okay. You're with Barrington the second and Dan Larson, so it's all good. Um I'm running for the fifth congressional seat in Georgia. My opponent is the legendary civil rights icon john lewis um the biggest staples of my platform is ubi however i go by calling it universal guarantee income um the next staple is universal health care i want to um bring back democracy and put the powers back into the hands of the people by establishing term limits i would like um to establish democracy dollars as um, Andrew Yang has stated, and just basically take the money out of politics to um, put it back power that is in the people's hands. Um, um, those are pretty much the basis of my platform along with the um, criminal justice piece that I would like to implement. We're basically uprooting the current justice system of America because it has not done, it has not given true justice to all. And I feel like it's time to level the playing field. Therefore, we can progress towards a future that we all can be proud of and that we all can, you know, um, possess some type of success uh, or however, whatever ideal we can see that's in a positive manner. I feel that um, you know we have to establish some type of rapport um, among all citizens in which people feel empowered within the government and within society. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that empowerment piece is. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I was just saying that empowerment piece, uh, what do you think are the key steps there to really getting empowerment um, changing in this nation? Well, um, first off, we have to attack the, the main issues within the nation. Uh, we have to attack classism. I feel that that's one of the biggest issues and it's one of the issues that gives way to a lot of the problems that we have in the nation. And um, I think we have to attack also on a social level, we have to attack racism. I've stated this with many of my interviews as well as um, many of the videos that I put out, but I feel that America as a society, especially American jurisprudence, is entrenched within racism. And if we want to move forward, um, and as far as you know, establishing the ideologies that this nation was built upon, we have to end racism completely. And the reason I'm saying this is because, of course, I'm, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the um, Aubrey situation that just recently occurred. And um, it's two other um, men that were killed by police unjustly. Uh, one of the guys, I, I still am not familiar, I'm still not totally familiar with the story, but if it's, if it's true that he was killed in his sleep, um, that's they cannot tolerate that. And another guy that was murdered by the cops on a, on a routine stop or something like that. And basically I feel like, um, the justice system has not has not been made to give justice to the people that deserves justice, and no, those are the victims. And oftentimes, you see the power structure of the justice system in which um, judges, lawyers, police are all together, and they all protect each other, and they're not they don't do the necessary job to protect the citizens um, that need protection the most because we are vulnerable as people. You know, when we get inside the system, there's nothing we can do, um, I, would, I would say, to basically liberate us from um, just the, the, res the restraints of prejudice and many of the things um, that happen like that. I can't, do you, do you know the, Dan, do you know the guy's name? I can't think of his name, but um, he was murdered in his sleep by the cops. They shot him through the window. Do you, are you familiar? Uh, last name, last name Reed. Yeah, it's something along those lines, Josh. Uh, I can't think of his name off the top of my head. Sean Reed? Not Sean Reed. Not Sean yeah, Reed. it's Sean Reed. So Sean he, Reed. 
He was actually being chased by the. No, no, oh, this okay. is, not Sean Reed. It's another one. It's another. I can't, I can't think. Of his, I can't think. I can't think of his name off the top of my head. But um, please read that story. He's twenty-one years old. Um, I can't think. Like twenty-one years old, he had guns. He wasn't supposed to have guns, and someone tipped off the cops. The cops did a um, a bust in his house around like late in the morning, and instead of um, doing or going by proper procedures, he was shot through the window while he was asleep, while his yeah. girlfriend was in the bed with him. So you see these things going on on a day-to-day -day basis, and you just wonder why this continues to happen to happens year after year after year after year, and why the necessary things aren't being done to uh, prohibit these things from occurring. And at this juncture, it's up to us as citizens to put our foot down, to say that we won't have any more, and to be more so proactive than reactive when it comes to things like this. Um, the basis of my entire platform is that with all the divisiveness that's been going on within politics over the last two election cycles, I feel that my policies and my platform in general brings everyone together, no matter what side of the field you play on, what's um, no matter if you're Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, no matter what you classify as, I feel that I have something for everyone. And I feel that I give um, us, as far as policy is concerned, a best way forward into establishing a, a country and an American society that we all can be proud of. Wow, I didn't know that. Uh, that one. I can't. If I can think of the guy's name, I will. I will blurt it out at some point in time because it's on the tip of my tongue. I just read about this story two two days ago. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, our, it, it's just uh, I apologize for the conversation. I'm just having a hard hard time hearing a little bit on my end because you're okay. you're stopping. But this this conversation around um, you know really, I think these are these are social issues and that right. manifest themselves as as uh, as criminal justice issues and and I think that our society could could do a a lot better. The people need to recognize that. Uh, Police are essentially unchecked, um, yeah. pretty much at every level, everywhere. Um, yeah. There's very little oversight for their actions, and and we see that they they get a free free pass. Um, and we're we're not really vetting people based off of or training them based off of um, to to counteract the issues that we're seeing. So, what do you think it, it would be substantial as far as from a legislative uh, perspective to really fight these issues. Okay, so for for my issues, um, well, my issue with police, for example, I think that we have to uproot um, all of these archaic ideologies that are still in play when it comes to the criminal justice system. For example, I have a personal belief that if you're a police officer, you cannot work at a precinct of a neighborhood that you don't live in. That makes absolutely no sense. You should only work in a precinct that in which the area is where you live at because of two reasons. One, if you're engaging with these people on a day-to-day -day basis, you're not gonna be so afraid of them. They're not gonna be afraid of you. They're gonna know who you are, which gives away to two, is that as soon as you get off of work and that badge is off of you, you're gonna have to run into these same individuals every day. And if you have to run into these same individuals every day, you're, not, you're, you're gonna be less likely to abuse your power or even have a have a incident where you may lose control of your own natural reactions to a situation that you're not supposed to lose control over. So oftentimes when many of these when many of these situations occur where someone is murdered or police use excessive force, they're not from the area. They they've never dealt with or come into close contact with many of the individuals that they are harming on a day-to-day -day basis and not on a day-to-day -day basis but they're not coming in contact yeah they're not coming in contact with the people on a day-to-day -day basis that, that they're harming and they're just not familiar with the culture of the communities that they're policing and i think 
Um, that's a big issue that's going on in America um, and uh, all across America in every police precinct. You know, you have guys, you know, they come in, get a badge and they feel like they have power and they abuse the power. But like I said, if you were to put these same individuals in their neighborhoods, they're going to be less likely um, to do all of these things. I feel that there needs to be a vetting, a better vetting process um, on the police force as well, on the police force as well, excuse me, um, like background checks, mental health checks. Um, you know, there needs to be, um, like, like really, really, really strict guidelines, um, to becoming a, a police officer because the, these incidents that continue to occur is inexcusable. You know, you know, you have a lot of, a lot of these men and women that are killed by cops, you know, like their families, you know, they leave their houses one day thinking that they're going to come home. And next thing you know, they don't come home. And it's normally due to uh, a simple decision that could have been made opposite of the decision that was made in that situation. And next thing you know, you have, you know, all of America um, saddened over an incident that could have been prevented it's easily, you know. Right. Right. So it sounds like the meat of it is uh, mental health screenings, um, mental health screenings, the requirement that police uh, actually live in or a a target of police actually living in the communities that they're policing. Yes. Um, and then just working on the, on on the social justice issues on top of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. You have to work on the social justice issues on top of that. Um, I think that also you have to look at um, a lot of the dynamics, excuse me, of what occurs, um, the court system, um, punishments specifically, you have to look at, um, we have to, we have to, uh, reassess our approach when it comes to drug, drug use, your drug usage and those who are addicted to drugs. Like, for example, if you're not, if you didn't commit a nonviolent crime, should you, you know, serve hard time, um, in prison with other criminals who committed violent crimes, you know, things of that nature. Um, you have to look, we also have to take a look at, uh, white collar crime because a lot, a lot of times, um, we tend to look at, um, you know, crimes of poverty. I'm going to get back to poverty in a second. We all, we always tend to look at crimes involving poverty and things of that nature, but white collar crime is something that occurs too. And we have to take a great look at that because that affects us as a society as well. But more than anything, we have to look at what causes crime we have to get to the very foundation of what causes crime and what causes crime i would say over 90 percent of the time is poverty why do people um why don't people have access to the things that they need why don't people have the same equity or equality um with you know the thing with um you know that as the people who, who do have the means to it's all about access it's all it's all about equity and once we get to the foundations of the problems, instead of trying to place, you know, band-aids on deep cut wounds, we'll be fine. But throughout history, we've what we've seen is every solution that has been presented has never been to try to take away the problem at, problem as a whole. Is based on placing a band-aid or something like a gunshot wound. You never fix the problem that way. Yeah. But yet and still. And the yeah. problem with that is you, we have these archaic thinking um, lawmakers who are in office who still do things the old way when time has passed them by, you know? And that's that's very problematic. Like, like for example, I give all respect, love, adoration, and reverence to my opponent. And I will never say anything um, to disrespect him or out of line because he's played a, he's paid a debt to society in order for me to even be able to speak to you, or in order for me to be able to run for Congress, or you, or in order for me to be, to be able to have a voice um, the way that I have. But there's no reason he has been in Congress since January 3rd, 1987, and I was born in 88. That's over 33 years. That's as an, as an right. excuse, you know? That's why I'm, I'm very um, big on term limits. Very big on term yeah. limits. So, uh I mean, it was great having you on. Um, it, how how how's the race going, and how do people get a hold of you? Oh man, um, race is going well. I have the Gimme Five initiative. That's hashtag G I M M E five. 
All I want people to do is follow me on all of my social medias. However, the Give Me Five comes in is that please um, tell five more people about me. If you support me, if you like what I'm saying, if you want to change, if you support anything of me, just pass along my social media to five people and then tell them to pass along to five people. That's all I want. All right. Well, I can't wait to work with you in Congress. We'll see Absolute, what happens. Absolutely, Dan the man. We will we'll do great things together. <laughs> yeah, we'll fix we'll fix this. We'll fix this. All right. All right, man. All right. So next up, uh, we have Daniel Craig Ross. Daniel is running for New York's second district, uh, originally held uh, by retiring Republican Peter King. Rather than give in to current party structure, Daniel Danny created his own ideology uh, to run under, uh, patriotic progressivism. Then underdog of then underdog of race, he has continued to be a true voice for the people and our progress our progress forward. Uh, no matter the circumstances uh, surrounded by. So, all right. Dan, how's it going? Oh, it's feeling good. Great. How are you? I it's going good. <laughs> I've been uh, out here for the last four hours trying to get back to where I am. But, um, you know, I'd rather do this here and let the people see exactly what we're going through. Okay. Uh, so how's the race going? Uh, what's going on there? So uh, effectively, our race has been postponed. Um, Cuomo has uh, shut that we're postponed from actually going out and getting signatures, balloting, canvassing, all of that. Um, but it's only the independent nomination. So to me, that's also, it's, you know, it shows to me a, it makes me very happy, honestly, that it's, you, that they obviously see something almost that we could be a threat. Why do you hold us back and you let everybody else continue to move forward? So um, I, I shun, and I'm completely ashamed of how he's doing this in such an undemocratic way. But at the same time, it shows that we're actually making a message that he may be hearing. And that's okay. honestly, good. we're shaking the status quo of these two party systems, which funnily enough is called the six party system. The six party system? I haven't heard that one. Oh, uh, yeah. The, uh, the six party system is the current uh, political system that we are under uh, with the Democrat, the current Democratic and Republican parties. OK, uh, so uh, who are you up against in your in your race? You running as an independent or uh, running uh, right now? I have I filed under other. They have me as a independent. Um, I would be running under the Patriotic Progressive People Party. Um, that's going to be, once we put that onto the ballot, that's what, what we'll be running under, though. Okay. And who are the front runners in that race? So right now, it is uh, Jackie Gordon and Andrew Garbino, I believe is how you pronounce his last name. I can be completely wrong, and I apologize, but they seem to be the two that will be uh, my competitors. Okay. And and your core platforms are, are uh, so are you for universal basic income? I am, yes. Very much and, so. And uh, criminal justice reform? I am, yes. Um, what about uh, what about the environment? What are your thoughts there? I mean, we are basically, everything is na nature and natural. So I believe that taking care of nature and returning to an equilibrium is the most important thing that we need to do. We look up and we're trying to manipulate the weather. We're trying to manipulate the ground, DNA. and. When you do that, it's going to come back with such a vengeance to try to go back to normal that it's never going to be, it, it, you can't do that. And we need to go back to our original roots of understanding what nature is rather than trying to be God and take over it. Okay. Uh, are there, are you uh, familiar with the Green New Deal at all? I am, yes. Parts of it. Um, there's a few parts that I am working on my own field along with a few others, but um. It's one of the things that we need to really sit down and look at and not make fantastic ideas and just say all these amazing policies that sound good, but will never work out. So I think we need to actually sit down logically, look at, at research, what can be done and say, this is how we can move forward. 
yeah, I think that sounds pretty reasonable. Um, there's a, a couple of things that have just politically divided people on that issue. Uh, the, what do you what do you think it's going to take to change this system? Uh, so right now, with the especially with coronavirus, um, I mean, this is just the beginning, honestly. Uh, this almost like a hundred years ago, you're going to have a depression. We already see the uh, the poultry. We see protein supplies are going down. And what I do believe is that the food supply is going to go down uh, much more dramatically than it is already. And then after that, you'll have the medicine supplies and the essential workers beginning to get sick from this. And with the, all these new strains that are coming out, now that I say we have an East, uh, East, uh, excuse me, an East Coast uh, version and a West Coast version, a new strain just appeared out of Europe. I do think that with the, us and Trump actually reopening the economy, it's going to cause much more problems on a whole new scale. And with that, you will then have a depression, which will then cause basically our society want for a strong central figure. I, I truly see that, especially with younger generations, my generation and younger, we have such a yearning for nostalgia, but we are never, we will never be like our parents. Very few people are like our parents where we have strong daring to make strong decisions. We are always looking up towards somebody. And with that, comes, you know, a yearning for a strong central figure. We see China, they said that only 800,000 people got sick. New York, my district right now, well, not even the county that I'm in right now, has more than that. We are, I think we are the, sec, the first or the second highest in the entire state. And when you look at that, and then you see how Cuomo and all these other figures came out and say, no, we need to take this and put this here. It's amazing. And before you would have seen that and said, oh, no, you can't do that. Now, it's why wouldn't you have done that? So right. I, I see the past is our present, but we need to look at the past and say, what went wrong and how can we avoid that in the future? Right. Yeah, I think that sounds like a, a pretty good talking point uh, for the future. So how do people get a hold of you? How do they support what you're doing? So you can reach me. Uh, my email uh, wait, well, you can, <laughs> my email um my website is ross for the letter uh, the number four ny at dot com excuse me and um yeah you can just go on my website you can shoot me an email um my email is patriots for again the letter not the number yeah, sorry the number not the letter and um so it's patriots for progress at gmail.com or you can also find that all on our website, like I said, is ross4ny.com. <laughs> All right, Ross. Well, it looks like you're you're uh, in the middle of uh, everything here today. So I uh, stay safe out there, man. Oh, I will. I got all my food right here, and then we're going to go home, get warm, and watch some TV. We'll be good. <laughs> all right. Good luck, man. Thank you. Yep. All right, everybody. Uh, so next we have... Um, Richard Thrip. Rich uh, joined us. Uh, Richard is a 28-year-old husband, father, uh, university instructor who is running for Congress as a, as a progressive Democrat, Democrat in Florida's 6th District, uh, which centers around Daytona Beach, where Richard was born and raised. Uh, he advocates for expanding Medicaid as a step towards Medicare for All, a Green New Deal, a universal basic income, Richard has a team of volunteers behind him uh, to flip the 6th District Blue, which suffers white, from widespread spread poverty, low-wage jobs, a uh, tenuous tourism economy uh, that has been left behind by the Republican leadership. So, all right. Richard, how are you? <laughs> good. How are you? <laughs> good. Good. Good to see you. Uh, so... Yeah, I've been over here getting stuff going with volunteers and uh, doing what we can online. We did this announcement and got a few hundred dollars came in on Act Blue. So I think, you know, there's a lot of motivation here. Uh, my background is uh, as someone who actually used to be a Republican, but just couldn't agree with a lot of what was going on, you know, just got worse and worse. And uh, I, I decided to, to run for Congress after I finished my PhD in education. So I'm a graduate of UCF, University of Central Florida, go Knights three times, did my bachelor's in psychology and a master's in PhD in education. 
Uh, so I started to run in January here in the sixth district, which is Palm Coast, Daytona Beach, Deltona, Deland. And I think uh, a lot of people are really, you know, hearing this um, rhetoric coming out from this administration saying, well, this just doesn't match up with our reality. You know, everything's not fine. The economy is strong for, for some people, but, you know, it's not strong for a lot of people here. We have a lot of poverty, a lot of low wage, you know, jobs, tourism, NASCAR here. Uh, the, the beach, but a lot of that is going to be, you know, depressed after coronavirus ends, and who knows how long that will take when you're getting more and more cases every day. So the incumbent here is is Michael Walsh, and he's a big uh, Trump supporter. He didn't used to be, but now he is. <laughs> he's always with him. <laughs> it kind of seems it kind of seems like a theme of the Republican Party. They all jumped. They all jumped on board shortly after 2016. But yeah. yeah, well, he was going on with Jeb Bush before that, and, and go. He even had an ad just just to say Trump's not good and don't don't vote for him. Like yeah. looking to his record. I think and my now, challenger actually, uh, or <laughs> the incumbent here, actually supported Rubio, and then oh, okay. now now he's full on full on uh, Trump. So. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> we still have Rubio. He thought about retiring or something, and now he's, you know, until 2022 at least. But then the previous guy is now the governor who had this district. So I'm, I'm running in that one. And, and it's like nobody else running for Democrats except one guy who uh, he's ran three times before. He moved to California, tried to run there too. So we have like a real good shot in August at the primary, and then we're coming up with, you know, how we're going to win the general against Walsh. Uh, I am actually Chinese American, but I, I was born here, and my, my mother's from um, northern China, came after Tiananmen Square. So my opponent now has really stepped up his rhetoric against China. He's saying, oh, I'm calling up Embry-Riddle University. You need to yeah. the Chinese students. They are. They're terrorists. They're spies. Yeah. And I, I, it's just total race baiting, and, and a lot of it is detached from reality. I mean, he's, not all of these students are spies, obviously, and they bring a lot of money here. You know, a lot well, of I, I, I do think that that is a top down strategy. I think they're sharing the the same talking points, which I find concerning. So it's. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. They get a memo not, and, then they do it, and they get the national support by doing it. It's not really about the local race. Uh, so anyway, a little bit about my platform. Uh, I'm, a, well, I'm a husband and a father to a one year old and I'm only 28 years old. Uh, I have run on, on a door saying Medicare for all, which I just call universal health care for all because people don't know what Medicare for all means. Uh, yeah. And also the universal basic income would really set this area, you know, um, not set it. I, I, it would help people so much here. I don't want to say set it on fire. It's like, that sound good. <laughs> but it would help people so much because we have a lot of, you know, people who never rose out of poverty. We don't even have a TV station here. So when people say, oh, it's hard to run in this district because you have to advertise in Orlando and Jacksonville. Did the Daytona Beach and, and the county in total, we have over half a million people in this county. Yeah. Um, so that would help people so much. And, and the same for a Green New Deal because we have you know, hurricanes here. We almost got hit by Dorian and we're lucky. We got hit by Matthew and that was the worst hurricane in my lifetime. And I remember Charlie Francis, uh, but for, for uh, Medicare for all along the step to that, if we could just get Florida to expand Medicaid, it would help so many people. Like I just did a calculation that, that we've lost $56 billion of federal funding since January 2014 by refusing to expand it. And then the governor has to go and say, well, we need more money for the low insurance, like high risk pool. Well, you would need that if you just expanded Medicaid. There's actually a bill in Congress that, that is proposed every turn, every session that would uh, expand it so that they could get 100% funding for the first three years. Because in the, uh, the Affordable Care Act, it was 2014 through 16. And then in 2020, it'd be only 90%. Well, if they just change that to be, oh, whenever your state agrees to expand it, you get 100%, I think now the momentum would be behind it because, look, people are losing their jobs here really bad. I mean, a lot of these jobs are in restaurants or in hotels. You know, we have a big uh, build up around NASCAR, uh, a lot of new development there of, uh, of various, you know, shops and, of yes. course, the NASCAR headquarters, too. And so then the, stuff. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, just a, a quick, since you brought up the Medicaid expansion, I just wanted to call out like the Republicans um, in Montana and the state legislator that mm -hmm. actually voted for the Medicaid expansion. Currently in the race, they're, they're being called socialists, uh, things like that. So there's, there's this anti, um, 
this this whole anti or counter movement against the Medicaid expansion. But I think what you called out there is is your the state of Florida is missing out on you said fifty five billion dollars worth. Of spending? Yeah, since 2014, 56 billion, and so twenty twenty two is probably about eighty. And our budget's only ninety billion a year in the state. It's not really socialism. I mean, you want to look at socialism? That's the big giveaways, you know, to the big corporations and to the ultra wealthy. And so the, uh, you know, we have Rick Scott saying that uh, people will be lazy, you know, if they got Medicaid. Oh my gosh, they're not going to work for their health insurance. Well, you know, you get a job here, and it probably doesn't come with health insurance anyway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, I need to mention my website. So I'm online at thrift.com. That's with an H, as you see below. And you can find me on Twitter by putting an X between my, my first and last name, just like one of the previous uh, guests. And I, I'm also, you know, on a few other sites, too. Uh, we got a nice new website. Some people say it looks like Pete Buttigieg's website. I didn't even think of that when we made it. <laughs> Yeah, so, so yeah, there's just not those jobs that provide health insurance without like paying a lot. And you know, when you lose your job, like you are now, it's what, what are you going to do? And here, if you're an adult, you don't have a kid below, you have to be below 29% of the federal poverty line. That's like no money at all as income. Uh, and, and so, when you talk about red and blue state bailouts, which as we know isn't true because Florida gets like a dollar 12 back for each dollar it puts in, whereas some of the blue states are less. Well, we're letting the other blue states get all this Medicaid that we're not getting, you know, and that is yep. better than Obamacare, the part of it with the exchange, because this is cutting out the middleman. It's not, I mean, we do have some middleman with the managed care plan, but we could yep. do so much better, you know, and, and giving people more, the people who need it, not the big companies and the big businesses. So find me online and uh, help me out if you can. We could use volunteers for phone banking and stuff. Send me a message on, on Twitter or wherever. So how's your campaign going? You getting enough support down there? Oh, well, you know, it's been it's been a bit tough because I started in January and I don't know what I'm doing really. So I'm getting going and now we've got a lot of OP, a lot of old, uh, staff and volunteers even for my opponent's campaign, like his campaign managers you haven't told him one yet, but he's on our team uh, for the primary. <laughs> and, and then we've also got some super volunteers for Nancy Soderbergh's campaign. So she ran, uh, she's a former ambassador, you know, knows Joe Biden, the Clintons real well. And she ran here in 2018, had tons of money, but it just didn't translate into votes, you know. And sometimes I wonder, what did her having $7 million raised do for her? Because, you know, you run these TV ads, every time you went on YouTube, it would be an ad for her. But she lost by 13 percentage points, even though the polls right up to the election said it was a dead heat. And so you wonder, but in this history, Obama had won in 08 and 12, but then Trump won by 17 points, you know. So a lot of people are kind of divorced from reality here. They they are against vote by mail, even though, you know, vote by mail is nonpartisan and we do it real well here. You don't need an excuse. You don't need nothing. They, they just send out, everybody got one. You can sign up by just filling it out and sending it in, in the mail, post it free. So, you know, I, I don't know, people are saying, uh, that that pandemic there's a lot of fans of that pandemic documentary which oh, is called, on yeah. on my my republican incumbent opponent on his page like i look at his comments and i'll get into fights with people so i gotta stop so doing, just to be clear your opponent yeah. your opponent is broadcasting the pandemic movie no no his commentators like on his facebook uh people in the comment section there's a lot of anti-vaxxers a lot and i i used to believe that too because i got a lot of that rhetoric from my family sure. but you know now i i learned especially as becoming a scientist and a phd that you know the evidence just doesn't support it like sometimes it seems like it does but you look into it more and it doesn't so I think that bring leads into like a pretty important topic, which I think is media literacy, because this the pandemic movie uh, essentially has been pulled down. It, it went viral last yeah. week. But if you look it up, you know, there are there's very, you know, specific, you know, criticisms of the claims that they were making. But when when you don't know. You know, a lot of people, this is dangerous information. So just be critical of yeah. all the information that you get. Uh, how do you think that we um, kind of change this for the next generation, Richard? 
Oh, well, we have to, I, I think that a lot of people on here were saying, you know, we need systemic change and like Citizens United. And there was a lot that led up to that it was horrible because you see, it's very cheap to buy a politician and, and that is a really good return on investment. So you get so many people in there who are, are literally saying now, oh, just let the people who are, you know, like they're in hell begging for water. Of course they want water. Just you don't have to give it to them. You know, that's what Mitch McConnell just said. It's ridiculous. And so we're going to face, like, this is kind of like real quick what we should be doing to to the climate crisis. You know, the yeah. cruises are really bad. You know, they, I, I've, I've gone on cruises, but I, I, you're not supposed to because it's like the dirty fuel and it's like not good for the earth and now we've cut down a lot on that but at the same time it could be bad in the long run because you know we can't recycle now because it's like everything has to be disposable you know and, and in the long run that's what's going to be the big super issue that faces america and all of the world is the climate crisis from the the gases that are in the air methane carbon dioxide water vapor etc florida hits we get hit hard in florida because the hot oceans and they just keep developing. We got development, 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 and it's never paid for. You know, they don't even charge impact fees for schools here because they just put in a big, uh, it's called the Jimmy Buffett theme uh, housing latitude Margaritaville. No impact fees for schools because no one under 18 is allowed to live there. <laughs> it's like, I mean, you have to be 50, but you know, you can't have your kids with you because it's like, well, we didn't pay the impact fees for the school. We don't care about education. We're done with our education, you know? And that type of attitude, it's, it's ridiculous, and, and you hear it a lot from from people who aren't really that well off, but they kind of feel like a a, so, uh, a psychological connection with the ultra rich, like billionaires. We say, oh, socialism. At the same time, they're getting VA benefits, you know, or they're getting yeah. like social security, which they paid into, of course, and they sacrificed for by being a veteran. But it's like, well, can't we have that for a whole country with how much? prosperity we produce, how much wealth that we produce. It's just incredible the wealth and prosperity that the United States of America produces. Yeah, I, I think that we we need to understand that there's a lot that we can do with monetary policy. There's a lot we can do to get... Yeah, uh, monetary and fiscal policy. Yeah, you got to yeah. have both. And the monetary policy just favors the big companies. I mean, look, with the Federal Reserve, they were there on day yeah. one to cut interest rates to zero. Now they're, bailing, they're, they're buying junk bonds. Well, why can't they buy mortgages? Why can't... Directly not not through securities why can't they buy yeah. your credit card debt and say oh dan you, you don't have to pay till next year and they still make money because credit card debt is profitable that's why these companies yeah. do so well well you know uh so it sounds like you you've got a lot of common sense solutions that would be nice to kind of pick your brain on on some of these things uh i really i really hope the race goes well for you how do how do we get more support going your way Oh, well, find me online at, at thrip.com. That's T H R I P P.com. And go ahead and like follow me on Twitter. Send me an email. My email is me at thrip.com. And, and you'll talk directly to me because I, I, I do a lot of like direct connections with people in, in the district. It's, it's a lot of work. I've been on the phone, I've been on the internet. Uh, I think we have a shot. And the reason we do is very somber, but you know, it's been laid bare how crazy this, this, this system that we have is. Um, and uh, of course, you know, you're a Republican who was against Trump, that, yeah. that he's just bundling it and uh, he's just deflecting and blaming everyone. So, yeah, get in touch with me online, especially if you're in the district. But even if you're not, you know, we could use all the help we can get because we're up against uh, a big money, you know, uh, corporatist. Yeah, big money corporatist, probably a good one to retire. So I mm -hmm. wish you the best of luck, Richard. Uh, all right. Thanks, thanks for coming up. Good to see you. All right, next up we have Rick Shepard. Uh, Rick Shepard uh, Rick Shepherd occupied Wall Street, uh, exposed institutional racism in Reno uh, Police Department, resulting in the termination of the Chief of Police. He is an NAACP Environment and Climate Justice Committee Chair. Uh, <laughs> and prior to the lockdown, he could regularly he could be regularly found in front of the federal building in the Reno protesting the injustice against the 99%. Uh, Rick is running in the U.S. House of Representatives in Nevada's 2nd Congressional District. Rick, how are you? It is a joy to see you again, sir. It's been too long, although it hasn't been that long. But it's, I enjoy our talks. It, well, it's, it's good to see you. Uh, 
Yeah, at the beginning of the apocalypse, we talked to each other. Plus, last week you were on a different planet, so it's good to see you back on planet Earth, there, Rick. Well, you're assuming this is planet Earth. This so, could be inside um, an O'Neill cylinder. It, it. Yes, maybe that's maybe that's somewhere else. Uh, it looks like a mountain range in Nevada. Yeah. It, it is. That's uh, actually a photograph that I have the kind permission to use from uh, Troy Wright. He's a friend of mine on Facebook who does some wonderful photography and videos, usually of the wild horses throughout the Nevada range. And uh, the only reason I didn't use one of his great wild horse photos is because if it's static in the background, it might look a little odd seeing a horse just standing there. <laughs> 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 All right, so uh, Rick, I'll I'll go ahead and let you you give a, a you know a, your talking points. Talk about how the race is going. I'm gonna be back here in just a couple of minutes. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. My name is Rick Shepard, and I'm running for Congress in Nevada's second congressional district. I'm running for Congress because climate change is an existential threat. Healthcare is a human right, and we need a universal basic income now more than ever. I am running for Congress because Congressman Mark Amaday is effectively useless and does not represent the needs of the people in Northern Nevada or the needs of America or planet Earth. If we are going to survive this pandemic, if we are going to persevere as a species, we have got to take control of the way we pollute our planet. We have got to take control of the way we behave towards each other. It is time to stand up to the 1%, the military industrial complex, big pharma, big ag, it is time to rein in Wall Street and bring about the change that lifts the 99% up. It is time for a new set of basic human rights. Seven of them, power, water, internet, housing, healthcare, education, and voting. Every American should have these as part of their citizenship, as a function of their being part of the wealthiest nation this planet has ever known. Here in Nevada, we have needs just like the rest of the country. One of them is water. There is nowhere left in Nevada to dig for water. If we are to survive, we are going to have to desalinate. As part of a national infrastructure program, this provides domestic jobs that are good paying and cannot be outs outsourced or exported. And think about it, we've done a wonderful job as a nation of expanding services across the country. Started with the railroads and the highways, telephone system, internet almost, we're getting there. But the point is top-down distributions of these kinds of networks makes perfect sense. And we've been really good at plumbing since the Roman times. So if we put these two ideas together, the idea of desalination as a national infrastructure ties in perfectly with the plumbing that's going to have to come in to bring clean water into Flint, to pull the salty water out of Florida and to bring fresh water into basin of Nevada. If we can build pipelines, to move hydrocarbons across this country, we can certainly do the same to move water. And at least when our pipelines break, the downside will just be one spot gets temporarily moistened. A far cry nicer than the pipeline bills that we've seen. And speaking of pipelines, if we're going to do anything about the climate change, we're going to have to be more, far more responsible with our emissions of CO2. There are 417 parts per million already in the atmosphere of CO2. And we need to get that down below 350. And if we're going to do that, extracting from beneath the soil and burning it is the last thing we need to do. We need to engage in carbon capture and sequestration as part of this national infrastructure program and thereby engage corporations, industry and capitalism to start capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere or from the water, using it to manufacture food, manufacture fuels like dimethyl ether and ethanol, to manufacture building materials. And when there's nothing left to manufacture, we can put it under the ground in magnesium deposits and turn it into limestone in 18 months, permanently sequestering it and reversing the effects. There is so much work to be done. And as this pandemic drags on, there's going to be even more. Going forward, who knows what the workforce is going to look like? Who knows what the job market's going to look like? But I can tell you, one of the other things that we need to address is onshoring our domestic needs. There are far too many of the health and well-being essentials that we rely on to come from other countries. If we can't provide the basics like small little plastic connectors or face masks for our personal protection equipment, then 
we have failed as a society. It is time to bring home industry, not because it is the cost effective solution, but because it is in our interest as a nation, it is in the interest of our national security and the well being of the citizens who live here. If we are going to survive, we have to act as one. Even though we come from different places and have different wants and needs, our basics are the same. As we lift from the bottom, taking those who have the least and bringing them up first, we will reduce the suffering, improve the quality of life in our country, in our, in our world, and hopefully we can produce a planet that our children can be proud of. Because if we do nothing, there will be no planet left for them to inhabit. I'm looking forward to a post-scarcity society where we live unencumbered by the, the, the daily burdens of disease and hunger and suffering. And if we are going to achieve anything that looks like this, we have to stop living in the past. And these incremental half steps, these small measures that are supposed to numb us are inadequate. And it is time to tell our leadership, irrespective of party affiliation, left, right, red, blue, it doesn't matter. The party leadership, the 1%, they've been bought for years. They cater to their corporate interests and them alone. It is time to stand up as a body, irrespective of your party affiliation, reject those individuals who are failing us, and one by one replace them with people like those who you've seen tonight, who will represent the needs of the people and not Wall Street, the 1%, the military industrial complex, and all the rest of the money deletes. Now, are you ready to fight for someone you don't know? Are you ready for a political revolution? Well, then get on over to rickshepherd.com and sign up and let's do this thing. And help out the others in your district. Because it's not me, it's us. Thanks. All right, well said, Rick. Well, well said. Uh, there's a one issue that uh, that I wanted to call out there. So you talked about water uh, pipelines going across mm -hmm. uh, as a solution, and yep. right now uh, Montana has the Keystone Excel pipeline coming in through our northern border. Um, so are you familiar with the issues with with pipelines? I'm familiar with the issues with pipelines moving hydrocarbons. Yeah. So they, they regularly leak. They're actually um, kind of subsidized, you know, from from our from a perspective where where um, we have energy companies that are promoting economic growth uh, through these pipeline developments. Uh, there's what does economic growth look like in Nevada if we moved away from fossil fuels? Uh, the thing is, you're not really moving away from fossil fuels immediately or even in the short term. As much as I would love for everyone to wake up tomorrow and unplug their Teslas and get about their day, there's going to be many years to come where there's going to be internal combustion engines. And the goal isn't as much to move off of fossil fuels. That is the goal ultimately. But the urgency is to stop adding CO2 to the atmosphere. And we can do that by moving to a carbon neutral cycle. Instead of extracting carbon uh, byproducts from the ground, refining it and turning it into gas, diesel, jet A. We can capture carbon from the atmosphere, synthesize dimethyl ether for diesel, ethanol for gasoline and jet A. And now those same vehicles that have been burning fuel like normal are going to continue to do so until they've been through their life cycle, but they're doing so as part of a carbon neutral cycle. And when it's fuels that we synthesize, we can modify them in any way we want. There's, there's not going to be any problems with trying to get sulfur out or any of the other things that usually involve some sort of, uh, of caustic or uh, dangerous chemicals and processes. So we're actually creating cleaner fuels that are going to burn cleaner and produce fewer pollutants as part of this. So the whole thing kind of, it helps. Ultimately, yes, we don't want any internal combustion engines. But between now and then, this is an intermediary step. And in so doing, you take those places that generate these, these solutions and you turn them into energy producers. Nevada imports $8 billion a year in hydrocarbons. You know, there is no reason why we can't create that ourselves. And instead of it being an $8 billion expenditure, it can be part of the economy for our state. There, there's no reason why we can't replicate that anywhere. You, know, yeah. you build a lifter and uh, carbon capture, the rest is chemistry and heat. Yeah, so that is the... Um... The model with thorium, but in the the interim uh, kind of conversation. So Nevada has been listed as one of the the larger areas for development for solar, 
And Montana has been listed one of the highest uh, wind energy uh, perspectives uh, or uh, potential um, states. And so there's a it, there's a need, uh, I guess, to to open up and, and share in energy better um, and then have wind offset solar, uh, things like that. Do you have any uh, perspective on that? Wind and solar are, are wonderful, but of course they're intermittent and diffuse, which makes them impossible to use for base load. You can hook them up to batteries for storage or you know, pumped hydro or stack rocks. I mean, there's plenty of ways to turn uh, potential energy into kinetic and back. But the problem is if you need to generate gigawatts of power, and that's what we're, that's the scale and scope we're talking about if you're talking about any kind of industry or development of a, of a community, these are the scales. And to pull gigawatts of power out of those kinds of things usually requires a fair bit of real estate. And although solar panels by themselves are generally set and forget once you're, once you're up and running, just clean the panels. Uh, the, the windmills require more maintenance in, in general. Ultimately, it's a matter of energy density and consistent supply. Now, I do love the idea of peaker plants being replaced by battery packs. Those make, that's, that's wonderful, but you still got to get your baseload power. Okay, and so within your uh, energy provider in Nevada, uh, do you think there's any short-term actions as far as are the, are they working well with the other providers around the West? I can't say. I honestly don't know for sure how their their relationship is. I, I do appreciate that the current model itself has has great many flaws to it. I believe that we need to move to some decentralized power generation and some more redundancy because our grid is is very unreliable in many places and it is nothing for there to be a, a windstorm or a snowstorm and to have some areas lose power for sometimes it's only minutes or hours uh, but even that can be enough if you've got a person who has an illness that requires power to maintain their well-being there are plenty of people who for whom a machine operating in their home is the difference between life and death and even five minutes without power can be that thing and so it's pretty important to be persistent mm -hmm. about this because just in in general there's far too many reasons to, uh, to to do a good job, but the one bad reason to do a bad job is money. It's always about you know saving costs, and as a result, you've got these these margins that are just too short. You know, we've seen it with the, with the healthcare crisis because of uh, the coronavirus. With just in time inventory leads to out of stock, as opposed to if we were truly prepared, we would have something at scale that was ready. That same problem it can be had in, in power generation. When you have a for-profit industry who's building out an infrastructure, they're going to do what's required of them and not a fraction more. And they won't have the motivation to interact with others, save for that what they're regulated and dictated to do. You come at this as a, as a national infrastructure program, we can take local utility monopolies and let them be infrastructure providers. You know, they roll bucket trucks and take care of down power lines. Mm -hmm. But as far as the energy generation and the supply to the people, I believe that needs to be provided as a domestic good. There, there needs to be a guarantee of service as a result of your citizenship and your residency in this country. Not only does that keep yeah. individuals alive and healthy, but it also serves as a huge economic boom for industry. Think about it. If you're a corporation that relies a great deal of, on energy as part of its production, say, for example, you produce uh, aluminum, uh, anything that works in, in, in the metals industry, but we'll use aluminum, for example, that takes a tremendous amount of electricity. Oftentimes, that's your single biggest input, even, even more than labor. If energy is provided as a domestic good, then that's effectively taking that cost off the bottom line of these corporations, giving them a leg up, making them more competitive abroad. Now, once you've made that that bar of aluminum, it's a it's a fixed good, and you can do whatever you want with it. And if you've done it using we the people's power, you've produced it at a cost that you're not going to be able to do better, even if you're paying good union domestic wages to produce it. Okay. Well, um, so how's your race going, and and how do people get involved? race is going well. We are making calls and sending texts and bringing in people. And, and it's, it's, it's a good time. The, the, the people I've talked to just today, I, I had, I, I had an emotional exchange with a lady this morning that, that reaffirmed my, my verve in this. And I had a, a, a one lady who was thinking about not voting at all. And I convinced her to uh -huh. not just 
reconsider it, but you know, vote and vote for me. So that, that felt like a double win. It's wonderful. So yeah, please go to rickshepherd.com to find out more, sign up, get involved. And if you are so inclined, run yourself, be a candidate. You can do it. Yeah. The world needs more independent voices. That's for sure. It does. All right, man. Rick. Uh, until next time, I, I can't wait to work with you in Congress, man. I am looking forward to meeting you IRL. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, I'm in Nevada a little bit. We'll, we'll get to see each other. Cool. All right. Next up, we have uh, Luchi Gayat. Uh, Luchi is a small business owner of Haitian descent who grew up in East Flatbush. Uh, he believes in real world experience. He believes his real world experience is what's needed to best serve the people of Brooklyn, uh, not a hand picked candidate by the wealthy elite. Lucci is running for the U.S. House of Representatives in New York's ninth congressional district. Lucci, how are you? How you doing, Dan? Good to see you, brother. Can good, you? good. I, it's good to meet you. Oh, I can hear you fine. Uh, So, good. So, I'll, uh, I guess, give you a few minutes to introduce yourself to to voters and kind of talk about what's going on in your race and and your overall platforms. Absolutely, brother. All right. Um, My name is Lucy Gayo. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and I'm running for the ninth congressional seat in Brooklyn. And what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm literally trying to do, bring a World War II like effort to bring the trades back into the schools. Um, first and foremost, that's one of the main uh, parts of my platform. Uh, reason being is I am a licensed New York City contractor, but that's not what I always did in life. Um, actually coming out of school, I came out of school with music. When I was in school, no one told me that music was not a uh, marketable skill. <laughs> so I came out of school with uh, no job and a lot of debt (laughs) in music. So I fell back on what I learned in high school, which was um, I learned a trade, I learned carpentry and um, wood shop, believe it or not. So I took that and actually turned it into a business, just the skills that I learned. And I came to figure out that what we need to do, because a lot of people speak about college, um, you know, tuition and how expensive it is. And the fact that the government should pay 100% of your tuition. So I'm like, well, Here's how we could fix this. Uh, let's bring the trades back into the schools, um, not just in construction skills, but of course also in robotics and in in AI, because no one in DC is talking about robotics and AI, but they sure are in China. They sure are in Europe. So I feel that's a conversation we need to start to have. Um, so I am championing that. Championing that. Uh, secondly, I want to make rent tax deductible, especially for the renters or the in Brooklyn. Rent is super expensive. For instance, when I was petitioning, a gentleman who worked for the MTA, that's the Mass Transit Authority in New York, um, the, 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 the gentleman made $50,000 a year. And out of that 50000 he spends 24000 a year in rent, but he still pays taxes on the full fifty. So I feel we need to update our tax code to include renters in order to allow for renters to be able to uh, enjoy the same tax benefits that that homeowners do. Um, and uh, lastly, of course, I am a UBI candidate. I'm part of the UBI caucus. I believe a UBI is access to upward mobility for most Americans, especially given what we're going through right now with COVID. Um, it, COVID has actually catapulted us forward. Um, I don't think anyone who's a UBI proponent could have ever have imagined that by February, March of this year, um, we would end up in a, in a situation where uh, a UBI it appears that it's the only solution moving forward. Um, so I'm definitely a proponent of, of UBI to give every American access to upward mobility. So hopefully we get to speak about all of this today, Dan. <laughs> yeah, so... Universal basic income, especially in COVID-19, I think currently mm-hmm. there's a, a proposal out there for $2,000 a month um, for 12 months. Uh, so how are voters uh, re- receiving your universal basic income message? Is it easier in New York or? 
it's it's a it, I would say under different circumstances it'll probably be a tougher sell. <laughs> uh, but it's a it's a it's actually a pretty easy sell, given um, considering. But as you know, in New York we also have well I think this is everywhere in the country we have social distancing, so it makes it quite difficult to campaign. So the only way we could actually campaign is how we're doing here. So for those who already know and understand the universal basic income, yeah. but believe it or not, the best advertisement or the best marketing was probably the twelve hundred dollar checks that just went out. <laughs> you know, that's probably <laughs> the- <laughs> yeah. It's it definitely yeah. It definitely gets people familiar with it. Uh, so, uh, any thoughts on how to pay for it? Are you with the value added tax? Uh, I, I I definitely think the value added tax does make sense in a lot of ways. The reason why it makes sense to me is I always like to kind of like break things down and just so I can actually explain it to somebody that that may be an opponent of it. So the way I see uh, how the value added tax works and makes sense is, uh, for instance, I always like to use this example. Uh, up here, when you go to McDonald's, you go to this screen, this huge flat screen, and that's how you make your order. You know, and uh, under normal times, before this type of technology automation, you'd have a young young uh, person behind the counter that's taking the order, and the little piece of that burger, a couple of cents of that burger, goes towards that person's salary. But now with these screens, that little piece of burger, that little, little uh, bit of money, goes straight to the top. So of course, you should tax a little bit of that value that's produced by that screen. That screen is producing value for McDonald's more so than just taking an order, but it's also producing value in terms of not having to pay a payroll tax, not having to pay an actual wage or a salary, then it's one person that had one person less that has a job. But remember, McDonald's still operates under the umbrella mm-hmm. of the United States where, you know, a lot of our tax dollars, infrastructure, certain things that uh, McDonald's will benefit for. So all we ask is for a small little piece of that, uh, of that, of that value that's produced by that screen which will cost a lot less than you even paying an employee. So that means you're still winning. And we put that across every industry. You're going to have your self-driving trucks. As a matter of fact, Volvo, go to Volvo website, look up Volvo self-driving truck. They actually have them out already, ready to go. They can post um, trailers from one end of the country to the next. And it's by Volvo. I mean, produced already. So automation is on its way here. You know, so we, we, we definitely got to make sure that, that we're prepared. Yeah, plus we have a, a couple of t- uh, pieces of the tax system that disadvantages labor overall. So payroll taxes, then the fact that we have health care connected to uh, employment. Are you for what, what do you think is our, our what do you think of, of as far as solutions for health care? Solution for health care? I, I think we need to also think outside the box. Uh, I, I like to be. I like to consider myself someone who is pragmatic, and also someone who who believes that it's okay to evolve, and it's also okay to change your mind. What I see with universal um, healthcare single payer, I think, is more possible now than ever before. Just like how you see um, many things being automated uh, because of COVID nineteen, so will healthcare. Think about this. We have, co- we, we have some companies in this country that will allow you to see a doctor uh, uh, over uh, the Internet or, you know, um, teleconferencing uh, for like 20 to 30 bucks a month. So let's say the United States government decides to buy everybody in this country a, prescri- uh, a subscription at 30 bucks a month per American. That's three times 12. What is that? 360 a year. And you can see a doctor wherever you want, wherever you want. And if it, it, it comes to where you actually have to physically see a doctor, then how about the doctor come to you? Not every single doctor who graduates medical school wants to go into debt with a doctor's office, with all that overhead, secretary, receptionist, all that money that, that, that gets spent before they even make the first dime. You know, So you're going to have some doctors that want to travel the world and just simply do doctor's visits when they're here. So we could establish a system where we could automate it even more so because COVID has taught us that we can automate that as well. And then for when you actually need to see a doctor, a doctor comes to see you. I could sit across from any conservative and get them to agree that that's the way forward. Even conservatives will say, you know what? I think we're gonna end up spending, I mean, we're gonna end up saving money. I did the math, it comes to about $15 billion a year. So 
That's one part of it when it comes to yeah, catastrophic. It's, it's, yes, go ahead. Yeah, as long as the solution at, at, at the end of the day is saving money. So there's a lot of uh, political control over the healthcare industry. Mm -hmm. um, and if you and I were sitting in, in Congress, how, how do you think that we could get get some simple proposals through, even though the voices of opposi opposition are going to be pretty, pretty high, pretty large? The voices of operation will be pretty large because you have to battle the powers that be in the money. You know, and so me, my approach to all of it is we all sit at the table. You know, you have major corporations that are highly invested. Mm -hmm. You've got these healthcare um, companies or these insurance companies. These these insurance funds fund a lot of other things, not just healthcare. So you got these huge insurance funds that are funding mortgages, that are funding all kinds of different investments around the world. You collapse an insurance company, watch the market fall. You know now. As a, a, a progressive, as a person who's very pragmatic, of course, I would love to see all the insurance companies just vaporize and just disappear for all the evils that they've done to a lot of people. Taking your money, not giving you the coverage, you already know. But at the same time, you got to take a step back and figure, well, they're going to fight me in Congress. Me and Dan, Dan and I in Congress will probably not be able to win. So here's what we do. We formulate a system that includes everybody and that makes sense. Remember that $35 a month? You got that $35 a month that covers every American. You can mm -hmm. see a doctor even if you're in Paris. And secondly now, when it comes to these insurance companies, all right, we'll let them come into the game. We need catastrophic coverage anyway. So what are you going to do? We'll let you compete with the government. The government offers catastrophic coverage at this much because we have a public option. What's your bet? Let them put their bet down. If they could provide a better service for, for, for less money, let them come into the marketplace. This is America. We're not... We're not a, 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 a communist country where you're not allowed to start a business in any industry. We'll regulate you and we'll allow you to, to participate, but you're also going to be fair. Um, I think by doing this, we're going to reduce so much cost in the system that even insurance companies themselves will make more money. You know, um, again, think about it. Back to the doctor service uh, over um, electronic means. You know, that saves so much money. The rest of it is gravy. So it sounds like what you're saying is you come up with a we work on a smart solution and then we we make it as universal and then make it make sense as as much sense as possible and then create consensus within within uh, actual voters you know people affected and then absolutely. bring that back right absolutely I mean I mean if, if people don't want to listen to it do like what Obama used to do. <laughs> Go on tour. <laughs> Go to that district. <laughs> Go on tour with it. Yeah. Go to that district. <laughs> hit him with hit him with the logic. Yeah. Yeah. Go to that district. So, um, speak to their people. <laughs> <laughs> um. So let's see. So a, you're up against who in there in New York? I'm up against an incumbent. She's been there about 14 years. Her name is Eva Clark. Uh, she's been there quite a while, you know, uh -huh. and I, we have a little bit of a history, about 15 years. <laughs> we go back a while, um, or at least what got me interested in running in the first place um, was an interaction that, that she and I had back in 2000, and, man, it's so long ago, 2004, <laughs> 2004, she was still in the city council, and we had a shelter that they wanted to build in our neighborhood. Now, everybody in the neighborhood was like, well, why are you making it a shelter? Why don't you make it low income or affordable housing? Make it something permanent. You know, with shelters, it's mm -hmm. in and out. Permanent, um, affordable housing, people get to stay there, you get to call their home. Well, uh, while we were there, no one was listening. They didn't care. They were like, well, the developer purchased their land. They could do whatever they want. You know, but what I was trying to say was that I get it, but since it's a shelter, that means the city's going to be financing the operations of the place. I think it makes more sense to put the money into... Uh, some kind of permanent living situation. Well, lo and behold, of course, the shelter gets built. No one listened mm -hmm. to us at the meeting, leaving the meeting, going home. Uh, 15 years ago, Google actually still did, uh, actually existed. So I Googled, how do you replace, uh, I think it was like city council. You know, I looked it up and it was such a complicated process because remember, at my tender age, at the time it was in my 20s, so at my tender age, and I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, you know, a couple years out of college, I didn't start my company yet. I don't know what I'm doing. 
So I'm like, you know, I, I really need to understand life, live life. So I kind of moved on, still stayed interested in politics. Um, but as I grew more, as I started my construction company, as I um, started the retail business, as I employed more people, as I handled people's health care, uh, um, paid for it and as expensive as it was, you know, the business ups and downs, how hard it is to, to raise money as a small business, you know, some months where you have to figure out uh, which cash advance you're going to need to take in order to cover what expenses. It's a lot as a small business owner. So mm -hmm. that experience completely changes you and changes your mindset. So now this is why I'm able to go into the arena and have these kind of conversations with you because now I have the life experience to be able to do this job, you know? So that's where I'm coming from with all of this. Yeah. I think that there needs to be more small business owners in, uh, in Congress and less, less of the, the financial elite. Um, Absolutely. So you said you, you have a, a contracting business plus you had a retail business as well. Correct. Correct. So retail and, um, and uh, you know, construction work, uh, maintenance, things of that nature. So how, how do we create a better small business environment in this nation, do you think? Well, to begin, we need a small business, uh, the small business administration to stop with the insane means testing. You know, um, it's not to say you shouldn't means test, you mm -hmm. can't just give away money. But at the same time, you can't make it impossible for people to borrow. You know, um, I, I'll give you my experience and why I feel this way. Uh, back, yeah. what was it, 2016, I applied for an SBA. Fine, approve. They asked you for a million pieces of documents to send it all in, do all this stuff. And at the very end, uh, I had another business arrangement with someone else and something else popped up. Just, you know, it was something very small. Not like anyone else would have loved you on that. Anyways, they, they didn't mind alone. I pick up the phone. I kid you not. I pick up the phone. I call Cash Advance Company. And within right, 12 Luigi, hours. I, I'm not sure if that's my end or yours. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? How about now? Nothing? Nothing? Oh, I, now I can I can hear you now. Okay. Um, can you maybe, hear me? I hear you. Maybe it was a signal. Um, yeah, so like I was saying. All right. um, yeah, so I, I really want to talk to you more about uh, the small business issues. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, it, it's great to see somebody like you running. I hope, hope that we work together soon. Um, yeah, so I guess the the listeners can hear you; they just can't can't hear me. But uh, I think oh. we are about about out of time. Why don't you, uh, if you can hear me, just go ahead and let people know how to get involved with your campaign. Yes, absolutely. So um, you can follow me on Twitter, Luchi Gallo, uh, on Twitter, Luchi Gallo on Facebook. Um, please follow me. Um, we're running a real content, a real um, competitive campaign. Um, please tell all your friends and family about a UBI candidate that exists. I've written a couple articles. If you look me up on Medium, um, Medium, or actually look, you can look at my uh, Facebook. You'll see the articles as well. Check them out. Check out my website, teamgayot.com. That's T-E-A-M-G-A-Y-O-T.com. Once again, thank you very much for watching, and uh, stay close. <laughs> Dad, you hear me now, or it's not <laughs> nothing. You want me to call back? You want me to, you want me to call? Uh, back I in? got you. Uh, I I got you now. I'm I'm gonna see if okay. I'm I'm hooked up better with uh, Jamar. So anyway, I'm sorry about the difficulties. <laughs> I think it's on my end. It's this rural broadband internet. We're gonna have to get that solved. So. Absolutely. All right. Fine. Thank Coming you very much, Luchi. Luchi I, I can't wait to work with you. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, so <clears throat> next up is uh, Dr. McGrum Montgomery. Um, 
So Dr. Montgomery isn't a traditional politician. He's a community justice advocate, an activist who believes in only he believes the only rights you have are the ones you exercise. He is an independent running in the United States Senate in Louisiana against the current Republican incumbent. Uh, he is a former U.S. Navy weapon systems engineer and a juvenile criminal justice attorney uh, with a, a Cato Parish Public Defender with the Cato Parish Public Defender's Office. Um, Dr. Montgomery, how are you? I can't hear you at all. Oh, you can't. Oh. But can you hear me now? All right. There we go. Hmm. It it might be on your end, but let's see. Let's see. I'm gonna go to the chat. I still can't hear you. Okay. Sorry about that, sir. Um, let's see. Okay, cool. Well, hello everyone. My name is Jamar Doc Montgomery and I'm running for United States Senate for the state of Louisiana. I'm running because I'm tired of people saying that young people aren't politically involved and politically educated. I'm running because our current representation doesn't represent you, doesn't make sure that you have what you need, doesn't make sure that your children have the education that they need isn't representing you as a parent or you as a worker trying to do its best to put food and shelter for your family. I'm running because there aren't people who look like me running for United States Senate. And what do I look like? I'm young, I'm educated, I'm a millennial. I'm 31 years old and I'm running for United States Senate. I'm running because People need an advocate. I'm running because people are disinterested in politics and it's because they see that their government doesn't work for them. And I'm here to work for the people of Louisiana and for the people of America. Some of the most important things and issues in our time right now have to, have to do with the economy and our health. COVID-19 has taken over the world and now we're fighting back to be able to get things back to normal but what is that new normal is that new normal uh overcrowded classrooms and underpaid teachers is that new normal still the same is that new normal still having businesses going into bankruptcy because they have to close down for three months and weren't able to get access to the PPP loans or the economic injury disaster loans. Is that new normal? Millions of students burdened down with student loans and student debt without a job that's going to be able to allow them to pay, let alone the interest on their loans. Our current representation doesn't represent us and is not connected with the people. Because of my connection with the people and because of my background as a community advocate, first with the NAACP in Ventura County, and next as a community justice advocate and a public defender, uh, public defender with the Cattle Parish Public Defender's Office, I understand the needs of the people and I'm connected with the people. I'm connected with your needs, I'm connected with your wants, I'm connected with your desires, and I'm connected with things that make you cry. I'd like to take some time to 
provide my condolences and my prayers for the families of Ahmad Arbery and Sean Reed. In having an equality in our country, it's requiring that we have some real hard conversations about equality and equity in this country. What it means to truly be the land of the free and the home of the brave. Free to express our grievances with our government and brave enough to stand up for what's right. In our current Congress, in our current Senate, we've seen what's been done right for large corporations and industry, but not for the American people. Not for the 31 million that are unemployed right now. Not for the hundreds of millions that are stuck at home right now without internet, without proper education, without the educational technology that they need to be successful. We have to ask ourselves, is that going to be part of the new normal? I didn't realize that I was going to get into this race until I realized how frustrated I was with the system. Many of us are told, well, if you got a problem with it, change it. And that's what I'm doing, running so that I can help change this system. There's no reason why a state such as Louisiana couldn't be the model for healthcare, couldn't be the model for education couldn't be the model for the economy. If we're able to fix Louisiana, who's 45th in healthcare, 48th in education, and 49th in economy, 48th in infrastructure, 50th in opportunity, 50th in crime and corrections, and 50th in natural environment, that we could serve as a national model for the United States on how we improve a state in the areas that matter. When we look at Louisiana, the largest concentration of crude oil refineries are here in Louisiana. The largest concentration of crude oil refineries here in the United States is in my state of Louisiana. We're second in the, in the nation for sugarcane and sweet potato production. We're third in petroleum, in petroleum producing. 25% of all natural gas production is here in Louisiana. 25% of all seafood consumed in the United States comes from Louisiana. And 25% of all petrochemical shipping in the United States is from Louisiana. Louisiana is not a poor state. What we have is poor representation. Louisiana is not a poor state. What we have are people who have forgotten that we are not poor people. It's just our thinking that needs to change. During this time of crisis, I encourage everyone to, to exercise smart financial, smart financial decisions. Part of those decisions is making sure that you save 10% because 40% of all American families are $400 away from a financial calamity, from being bankrupt. 40%. Save your 10%, save 10% save for your savings so that you have some kind of cushion. Some of us are, aren't able to utilize our unemployment benefits. Some of us aren't eligible for un unemployment benefits. And it's making sure that we utilize the best financial advice and also the best financial savings methods during this difficult time. Thank you. If you wanna find more information, you can find me at www.docmontgomeryfor2020.com. That's D-O-C Montgomery, M-O-N-T-G-O-M-E-R-Y, for for dot com. I'm also on Facebook, uh, Jamar Doc Montgomery for Louisiana, and I'm also on Instagram, uh, Doc Montgomery twenty twenty, 
And you can also find me on Twitter, Doc Monty for 2020. Thank you. Thanks. I, can, I don't suppose you can hear me, right? Oh, now I can hear you. Now I can hear you. Oh, great. Yeah, it's good to meet you. Uh, good to meet you. I was well. like, man, here's such an inspirational person, and I'm, and I'm um, unable to, to chat with you. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so you're running as an independent, right? I'm running as an independent. And uh, so is there a path to victory, you think, in, uh, for your race? But, you know, well, the challenge is, is, and the challenge is, is that they say that independents don't win in Louisiana, um, and in Louisiana, and as uh, throughout most of the nation, is that we've been focusing on what parties that people have come from. Uh, but if mm -hmm. the party that you belong to isn't making sure that you have enough money to pay your bills, or making sure that your businesses thrives during this time, or is focused on on making sure that large corporations uh, are getting most of the relief, then that's an issue. If your party mm -hmm. isn't advocating for you, then I ask, well, why are you still with that party? Uh, it's funny that uh, our current president, he asks people, what do you have to lose by yeah. voting for me, right? What do you have to lose? And it's, it's, it's a critique on the current parties and how they have continued to operate during this time and for the last 40 years. So, a path to victory, yes, is possible. It's making sure that my name gets out and, and being current and being relevant with the issues of the people of Louisiana. Yeah, I really hope your your name gets out. I actually I'm I'm hoping that uh, people like Justin Amash and stuff come up and they they get more visibility because I think there's a lot of a lot of votes that, that need to that that want to get out there. I think we're living in unprecedented times. Mm -hmm. And people don't realize that if you want to take your power back, it's right there in the center. It's that independent voice. It's that 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 person that's going to represent you and and not the corporations. And I just wish we could build this swell of of, of support around this nation for it. So like when 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 you put your hat in the ring, like people people understand that they've got a different choice. So uh, describe your uh, you you've got a it's a Republican district, right? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, so uh, does, who's funding who's funding your uh, your challenger? I mean, your incumbent. Who's ch everybody? <laughs> everybody might. Okay, be, be so the earning. the big ones. Give me the, the top three. Uh, that I don't have on hand right now. That information I don't have on hand right now. What about industries? Industries, uh, medical industry is 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 funding him, um, as well as he's got connections. He's got connections to the oil and gas as well. Mm hmm. Yeah. So I think oil and gas are it, are funding my uh, Republican um, incumbent as well. Uh, so so I think to have a better conversation in this country, we definitely need to have people that are not um, funded by funded by those industries. What do you think about that? Well, it's on one hand on, on, on I think money and politics dirties a dirties the entire dirties the entire process um it makes it very sure. difficult for the marketplace of ideas to truly be a marketplace of ideas when your i when the visibility of your idea is based upon how much money that you have to push it so the issue that i have with with industry is is not so much uh Industry has taken advantage of rules that were created by past representatives and current representatives. And they're taking full advantage of those rules because they're involved and recognize that their interests are tied to making sure that our legislators put in laws that benefit them. If we want to change that, we have to get people in there who understand that and are willing to change it. Uh, but if we don't, then we're going to have the same system that we have, have currently. Uh, there's no reason why that corporations who only provide, you know, 300 some odd billion dollars worth of tax revenue uh, receive much greater than their share in, in in relief money than what they've even paid in federal mm -hmm. taxes. That's a major issue. 
whereas the American people pay almost nine to ten times more in taxes than corporations, yet received uh, less than a sixth than what they pay in taxes from our own tax money. I think that's a major issue. So it's, it shows that where you where your treasure is, so your heart lays as well. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a pretty pretty powerful observation there. Uh, I uh, man, uh, so you talk about healthcare, talk about health, energy. Uh, you've got universal basic income. Do you uh, support uh, changing taxes? Well, I support changing taxes. I, sh I think the way that we spend our tax dollars right now is something that needs to be changed. Um, we we okay. talked about we didn't have money for health care. We don't have money for this, but we just pulled $2.2 trillion out of I don't know where. Uh, so now right. we see that the priorities and now the part that also the issue that I have is that it took us only two months, two months to pass that spending bill. But we argued for a, a year and a half, two years for affordable health care. So I think the way in which right. we identify our priorities and the way that we spend our money uh, needs to be changed. And um, if we realize, if we look at 70 percent of the United States economy is based off of consumer spending. 70 percent. Mm -hmm. So. If we look at taxes and who's truly taxed the most, it's individuals. It's not corporations. Mm -hmm. So if we change up Absolutely. the way, if we change up the way that we tax, in fact, go to something very simplified. Um, Herman Cain had a great idea with the 999. Now you have a much, much streamlined tax code and now have an opportunity of really gauging your economy. But that presents a problem when you're trying to financialize your economy. Yeah, yeah. How many how many votes do you need to win? Because I'd like to work with you in the Senate. Oh man, I'd like to work with you too. We're going. We're shooting for a million votes. A million votes. A okay. million votes. And uh, support sy support systems and structures are, are are is the media paying attention to you? In certain places, in certain places, uh, I have I have a I have a community advocacy background uh, in Baton Rouge and also in Shreveport. Uh, so I'm known uh, I'm relatively known mm -hmm. in, in, in Baton Rouge, but I'm definitely known in Shreveport. Um, let's see. Uh, what do you think of the black eye Louisiana took over the much publicized leading the nation in number of COVID-19 cases narrative. Well, I think that it speaks to our economy. It really speaks to our economy. When people are, have to choose between their lives and their livelihood, and you look at in Louisiana, that's 40% uh, 40, 40 African-American, you look at the income and wealth mm -hmm. disparity that's in Louisiana. The many of the people, many of the, the African-American people that live in Louisiana work in service jobs, work in jobs that are consider necessary now considered essential. Our grocery workers, uh, some of our, uh, our our grocery workers and some of our other service workers, uh, even in the, even in healthcare. So when you look at the disparities in race that comes to COVID-19, it speaks to also not only this incidental a disparity, but also the systemic and structural disparities in healthcare as it as it pertains to race. So, COVID nineteen wasn't necessarily the problem, but COVID nineteen definitely illuminated existing problems in the healthcare system here in Louisiana and also in the United States. An issue of capacity of access and capacity. It, it I know in Baton Rouge mm -hmm. there was a major fight uh, that that I helped with was uh, we were trying to prevent Earl K. Long Hospital from being closed down. Earl K. Long Hospital was the only hospital that was near that, that would be able to handle uh, gunshot wounds and other traumas, but it was located in a predominantly African-American neighborhood. So mm -hmm. COVID-19 and the number, the dis desperate numbers that we're seeing in, when it comes to African-Americans deals with the systemic and structural issues with access to health care and also the capacity for health care. Right. 
Right. So, man, um, the the, uh, the access to to healthcare and some of the systemic issues that we have. Um, do you think those are independent issues of what we're going to need to solve with criminal justice and, and um, you know just environmental justice? overall or do you think that there's specific actions that we could target in each 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 one of these um issues i think that there's i think there's specific that we can we can handle there's specific issues within each one but we know that our world is interconnected and our world is interconnected Mm -hmm. this way if i am unhealthy i can't go to work if i can't go to work then I have a less productive economy. So if we focus, we make a a, a greater focus and a greater push for education for, a greater push for access and education for preventative healthcare and also clinical healthcare, where if if you got $50, you can go see a doctor. If you have $100, you can go to a clinic, you can go to a clinic. But making access to health care uh, and affordable access to health care, number one, if you have health insu- if, if you have health insurance, all right, great. But being having access to preventative care, uh, preventative care and clinical care that's cheap, I think is a better way mm-hmm. and a, is a better way and more economical way of handling health care here in Louisiana. Uh, we have a major issue yeah. with obesity. If you understood, if people yeah. understood that the bad drinks and, and chips and stuff that we're eating now is going to cause us health issues in the future, they don't see, you don't, you don't see how drinking that soda is going to lead to diabetes when you're 70. You don't mm-hmm. see that as, as somebody young. But if you're educated on it and you witness it, now you can make a conscious decision. So with healthcare having uh, cheap, uh, cheap preventative doctor visits and and clinical visits, with uh, with criminal justice reducing juvenile incarceration, uh, I'm a I'm a juvenile cri- I hate that word juvenile. I'm a child defense attorney, criminal defense attorney. Yeah. So I see how we have to change juvenile justice here in America if we have our children dressed up in orange jumpsuits all we are doing is just preparing them to be real life criminals when they turn 18 is recognizing mm-hmm. that every child is worth saving and also every child is worth pouring into and the decisions that they make is based upon the exposure to information that they have so reducing juvenile incarceration and providing more programs and after school programs and especially early childhood education programs because the fall of a nation begins in the homes of its people and whatever we can do to make sure that we have our homes and our families intact then we will have a strong and prosperous america yep 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 and then there's systemic issues too within the food supply that uh that i I think we could go after pretty easily as well once we take the corporations out of this this uh out of Washington, I think we can get a lot of this stuff. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So organizing, organizing. So your state's still in in lockdown, right? Yes, the lockdown order gets lifted May fifteenth. May fifteenth. Do you think that it's too early? I think. I think that. I think that we have to do more education on on this virus, and what no. I mean by that is that social distancing and wearing your mask, social distancing and wearing your mask. If, if you're not unable to provide that social distance, you need to have your mask on. Um, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's too soon. I, and the reason why I don't know if it's too soon is because I would want to defer to the people who are experts in that area. But mm-hmm. if people in Louisiana yeah. go back to business as normal, as usual, uh, then we're going to have major, major issues. So it's recognizing that it, it's recognizing that washing your hands is important. <laughs> things like that, yes. those simple things that we can do to well, help I, prevent the spread of this virus. 
That, that's an important call out because there's a lot of disinformation coming out now. And there's a lot of people that are, are chastising others for, for being moderate or responsive to um, in their own actions as far as washing their hands, wearing masks. Um, a lot of people are, are, are spreading a lot of conspiracy theories. And I just want to know, I mean, I just wanted to put, highlight, you know, that this is a call for reasonable action. This is, let's be, let's be conservative and, and consistent in our approach. Um, Cause we're definitely not getting a consistent message at the top of this nation. So I think that it's up, up to us in our communities to be more responsible voices. I think an, I, I think an aggressive when we see countries who have had a, a an aggressive response, uh, it's been it, it's mm -hmm. been beneficial. It's been to their benefit. Um, mm -hmm. I'm an in, I'm, I'm also an engineer. So if you incorrectly define the problem, you won't be able to find the you'll get lucky if you find the correct solution. So if we correctly identify the problem and have the right experts, the, the experts guiding the ship during this crisis, um, it should be the experts guiding the ship. Then I think that we can, we 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 can make some some smart and responsible moves. Yeah. Well. Well. Thanks for coming on this 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 format. It, it's uh, very energizing to see a candidate like yourself uh, running for U.S. Senate. It's a big office. Um, I, I imagine like your full family is behind you as well, right? Yeah, man, my my I, my daughter is always making sure that I'm introducing juicing myself to everyone, and it's really uh -huh. it's it's a challenging it's a challenging process it's a challenging process and it's a process that will pull everything out of you, pull yeah. everything out of yeah. you. Yeah, it makes um, you it makes you think about a lot of things too. It does. Um, so you're uh, it, how's the Democrat in the race? I think he's doing well. Last time I checked, he was doing well. Uh, the issue for us is on? all of us have had to switch up our strategies to a more virtual strategy and being okay. able to have constant contact with people and people knowing who we are. And that that has been the uh, I think all the candidates, that's what they're focused on right now. That's definitely what my team is focused on. So what what can we do to help you get what volunteers, can we get help? voices out there for you? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Please visit my website, www.docmontgomery4for2020.com. Uh, we are accepting volunteers, people who are willing to send text blasts, people who are willing to call. We are accepting all volunteers. Thank you so much. Please share our message on our Facebook page, Jamar Doc Montgomery for Louisiana, and also uh, my Instagram page, Doc Montgomery 2020. All right. Well, I, I hope we get to work together. Um, it, 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 I, I'm going to try to see what I can do to get to get you elected here. Um, Thank you, man. And please, you know, we're trying to do this weekly. So, you know, if, if you want to come back on, we're, we're trying to create a platform for a lot of us to get get out there. So. Absolutely. Thank you. And some other voices. So. All right. Hey. All right. Oh, uh, when's your primary? Or you're in the general. We're way. Oh, oh I'm sorry. The uh, November third. So you're going all the way to November third. So everybody, if you're paying attention, you have all the way till November third to help uh, help get Doc Montgomery elected. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> all right. Talk to you later. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, this has been an experience. Uh, let's keep this going. Uh, it's important. Uh, people need to realize that there just isn't isn't enough money in campaign funds to get independent voices elected. Plus, we have um, we have you know over 800 people nationwide uh, running for office, so it's hard to to pull ourselves out of this uh, pull pull our voices ahead of of the others um, that we're challenging. So, um, if you want to see what democracy looks like tomorrow, let's keep efforts like this going. Because uh, you're going to see a lot of different candidates uh, in the future, and we should all be looking for the ones that uh, don't have a thumb on the scale for them. So anyway, have a good night. Thank you for watching.